Vivian, do you want to get started? Oh, I should I start? I think so. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for the second EpiSkills talk that we are having as a series of four talks um, in replacement of the African League Against Epilepsy Conference. Today, we're going to be discussing research insights, everything you need to know. We've uh, selected a number of amazing talkers, speakers today that will be sharing with us a lot of insights and we're excited for you to attend this. Um, I will go ahead and uh, have the panelists introduce themselves, um, starting over with you, Joe. Thanks, Vivian. So welcome, everybody. I'm so excited that we're having our number two of our EpiSkills. So um, I'm a child neurologist from Cape Town, South Africa. I've got a special interest in epilepsy. I'm the current chair of uh, ILIA Africa. And uh, Vivian, I'd like you to introduce yourself. I'm Vivian. I am a pediatrician um, with interest in neurology and epilepsy um, from Uganda. Next. Alina, you're muted. Go for it. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Alina Esterhazen. I'm a molecular geneticist at the University of Cape Town, Division of Human Genetics, and also the National Health Laboratory Service. And I have a special interest in um, genetic epilepsies. Thank you. Wonderful. Vivian, with your permission, can I introduce the first speaker? Yes, please go ahead and introduce the very first speaker. So I'm very excited for us to kick off with this. And so the first person that we've got presenting today is uh, Associate Professor Pauline Samia, who is Chair of the Department of Pediatrics at the Aga Khan um, University Hospital, as well as being um, Lead for Pediatric Neurology um, in the Centre. She um, has many skills and many roles. Uh, and multiple publications and collaborations. Um, she's been co-lead in developing pediatric neurology training within Kenya. She's in the process of completing uh, a PhD in the ketogenic diet, which is a, a brave undertaking, as well as having leadership roles within the International League Against Epilepsy and serving on the executive board of uh, the International Child Neurology Association. And her key research interests are epilepsy, ADHD, cerebral palsy, and preterm both. And I'm really looking forward to hearing her presentation today on research in epilepsy with an African overview. Thank you. So hello everyone. I wish to thank the organizers of this meeting for inviting me to speak on the status of research in epilepsy in Africa to provide an, over, an overview. I'm Dr. Pauline Samia. I'm a pediatric neurologist based at the Aga Khan University in East Africa. To achieve these goals, I will present a recently concluded scoping review conducted by the International League Against Epilepsy Pediatrics Commission's uh, Research Advocacy Task Force that focused on epilepsy research in Africa. I was the lead author uh, on this paper, but um, I would not have achieved this without the contributions of my colleagues, uh, Jane Hazel, Jessica Hudson, Azim Ahmed, Jasmeet Shah, Charles Hammond, Edward Kija, Stefano Bean, and Joe Wormsest. So in this talk, we shall look at the background to the scoping review. I shall present the methodology we followed, the results of the scoping review, the conclusions and the recommendations. So by way of background, we know that uh, low and middle income countries, especially those in Africa, bear the body, highest burden of epilepsy. The median prevalence of active epilepsy in high income countries is 4.9 per thousand compared to 12.7 per thousand in rural areas of resource limited countries. Despite the high prevalence of epilepsy in Africa, evaluation of epilepsy research trends on the continent is lacking. The significant disparity in numbers is attributable to increased risk factors for epilepsy in these settings, such as infectious diseases, preventable health, brain injuries, as well as poor access to, as well as low capacity of the healthcare services. Analysis is lacking 
that critiques epilepsy research trends in Africa. Despite the exponential increase in epilepsy genetics research across resource equipped settings, for example, such data is largely unavailable in Africa. High income countries over time have documented trends in epilepsy research and patient experience, which have directly led to improved epilepsy management, as well as outcomes in these settings. So therefore, understanding the current trends in epilepsy research in Africa would identify regionally relevant focus themes and strategize critical gaps in research which are necessary to optimize epilepsy care. So the methodology we followed was the Joanna Briggs Institute's approach for conducting a scoping review. So we identified the research questions, uh, relevant databases, agreed on how to select the studies, uh, data extraction, as well as result interpretation. So a scoping review of literature on epilepsy from Africa published between uh, 1989 and 2019 was conducted. We defined an African study as one based uh, in an African country or African countries on an epilepsy related topic. Collaborative studies with additional non-African countries were included, but the focus of the data collection needed to be on epilepsy in Africa. So these are the International League Against Epilepsy regions and Africa, and this study uh, therefore included countries in Africa, as well as the East Mediterranean uh, ILEE regions. And this was done for completeness. As you can see, Africa actually falls in the two regions. And we thought that to include both, uh, all the countries on the continent would give a clearer picture of the scope, uh, to the scoping review, to the findings of the scoping review. So the research questions we explored included, what is the epilepsy research conducted in Africa? What are the areas that are under-researched based on the published epilepsy topics? So we focused on the types of research that had been published, the focus of these publications, as well as the trends in frequency of these publications over time. We explored these three databases, MBIS, Medline, as well as the African Journals Online. And we used the keywords, seizures, convulsions, epilepsy, Africa, as well as specific uh, African country names, you know, there are 54 of them, as well as regions such as North Africa, West Africa, East Africa, and South Africa. So regarding the results, um, here presented is the, the Prisma flowchart for this uh, specific scoping review. So through this database searching, we identified 3,122 publications. We did not find any other uh, additional ones through other sources. Following screening, uh, we excluded 882. When we assessed the publications for eligibility, we excluded another 1,013 because they either focused on acute symptomatic seizures or there were studies that were published prior to 1989. And uh, we had a 514, which did not contain any information on related to basic science or patient derived data on epilepsy, which was important for this study. So in the final analysis, we included 1,227 publications. So on this slide, uh, we show the trends in publication numbers, as well as the African lead uh, authorship trends between 1989 and 2019. So on this graph, we can see that generally from 1989 to 2019, there has been an increase in an increasing trend of the publications. You can also have an idea of uh, the proportion of publications that had first and last authors on them. That has generally increased over time. We also sought to look at the data according to the decades, you know, so between 1989 and uh, 1998, from 1999 to 2008, and then again 2009 to 2019. So when we looked at the trends, clearly the number of publications was increasing, and unfortunately though, 
the proportion of first uh, or last African author position compared to first on and or last proportion, uh, uh, author position uh, was not statistically significant over the three time periods. So it remained more or less the same, although the publications themselves were increasing. So this is an interesting heat map of the distribution of the publications in Africa. And unfortunately, 14 African countries had no identified publications on epilepsy over this study period. So you'll notice those ones are labeled in red across the continent. And we also display the remaining 40 countries that had publications identified. So West Africa had the highest proportion of research conducted, uh, accounting for 35% of total research uh, identified, while Central Africa had the least, it accounted for only 7%. Multi-center African studies accounted for 27% of the total publications identified. So on this slide, uh, we uh, present the most prolific countries. And these were African countries with over 50 publications on epilepsy topics, uh, illustrating the increase in publications over time, especially so between 2009 to 2019. So the most prolific countries were Kenya, Tunisia, Ethiopia, Cameroon, Tanzania, Egypt, Uganda, South Africa, and the most prolific being Nigeria. So what were the themes of research that were prominent in this uh, scoping review? First and foremost, there was a balance between studies that were investigating specifically adults and children, with 37% of the reports including all ages. There were only 2% of the studies that focused on women with epilepsy. A total of 38 studies noted unique African themes, and I'll get back to these uh, shortly. And some of these uh, themes and focus areas included mostly descriptive clinical studies, uh, which accounted for 56%, social components, 26%, interventional studies, 7%, basic science in 6% of the publications, Diagnostic studies in 4% uh, and systematic reviews only accounted for 1% of the publications. So what were the focus areas? Uh, etiology was explored in uh, almost a quarter of the publications, clinical features in almost another quarter, epidemiology in 16%, drug management in 12%, and long-term outcomes in 6%. So this uh, graph also shows uh, the distribution of these themes of research. You can see once again, clinical epilepsy, especially so descriptive in nature, uh, was the predominant theme. Diagnostic studies are represented by the green color and those were pretty few, as were basic science uh, studies that were more commonly uh, identified in West Africa, Southern Africa, and sometimes also in Central Africa. So regarding themes that were unique to Africa, a total of 194 studies described etiologies of special interest to Africa. This included nodding syndrome in 27% of uh, these 194 studies, neurocystis psychosis in 34%, cerebral malaria 8%, HIV, which is a significant problem in only 6% of the, uh, these unique themes. It's interesting to note that uh, bath asphyxia, sickle cell disease, tuberculosis, and trauma had much fewer publication reports, despite the significant impact this has on the populations in Africa and their known contributions as etiologies to epilepsy on the continent. So to explore a little bit more on the themes unique to Africa, uh, we looked at neurocystic psychosis, nodding syndrome, uh, traditional healers and ethnopharmacology. So neurocystis psychosis is an established public health issue related to poor pig pen uh, management resulting in food contamination. So we found epidemiological studies that confirmed that in some areas, some regions, neurocystis psychosis was the predominant cause of epilepsy in adults. This is a preventable cause of epilepsy. There were studies on neurocystis psychosis that also confirmed the high disability adjusted life years 
that resulted from infections and the T solium resulting in neurocysticycosis, talking to the significance of this condition in these regions. So this remains a significant area in epilepsy research because there are still unknown pathogenic aspects of the disease, including the relationship, for example, between tinea solia and the development in seizures, of seizures in certain specific individuals. So why do some develop epilepsy while others don't, for example? So the other theme that was very extensively researched on the continent and unique to the continent was Nodding syndrome. So Nodding syndrome is a condition uh, prevalent in Uganda, Tanzania, and Sudan, with significant variation in phenotypic expression reported. We observed or in, this scoping, in this scoping review more than 50 publications in the last decade, which focused on the clinical, electroclinical, biomedical, and epidemiology of Nodding syndrome. We also identified studies that um, uh, focused on community-directed treatment with ivermectin and doxycycline with significant positive impact reported. So symptomatic guidelines were developed as reported in these studies by the leading African clinicians and were successfully implemented, leading to reduction in some areas in the observation of uh, Nordic syndrome. So another theme that was extensively explored is the contribution of traditional healers to the management of epilepsy. So many studies reported that people living with epilepsy chose traditional healers over healthcare professionals as their preferred practitioners. So this is, was found to be driven by belief and culture in specific regions, as well as the cost-effective payment methods that were available, as well as better availability of the traditional healers to the patients compared to availability of trained healthcare professionals. So the trends in research over time uh, on traditional healers moved towards working with traditional healers to build on resources to support people with epilepsy. And there are studies that uh, reported improved retention in regular care for people living with epilepsy once traditional healers were incorporated in the advocacy efforts, as well as identification of patients living with epilepsy. Another interesting area was ethnopharmacology. So extensive studies observed an overlap with traditional healer practice. So the better understood um, substances that they thought you know, had significant or, you know, had some impact in the outcomes of epilepsy in these uh, populations, in these regions. And there were also studies that looked at a formal evaluation of substances found in uh, herbs and uh, products in these regions. And these studies basically uh, zeroed in on early animal models, typically mice that were used to explore the role of the various products. Majority of these studies were from West and South Africa. And definitely these substances hold potential for future use as anti-seizure medications for these populations. So we also explored the availability of research funding on the continent. And unfortunately, only 3% of the studies that were identified actually reported a funding source. So the total number of studies that reported a funding source were only 361 of the 1,227 that we included. Four of these were pharma-driven. Uh, only 110 reported a formal research grant. Associations funded 15 of these studies and other uh, sources were cited. These were potentially universities, as well as well-wishers and individual clinical practitioners that um, uh, provided research funding. So what were the conclusions we could draw from this scoping review? Compared to better resourced regions, availability of data on epilepsy from Africa is definitely wanting. Strategies to reverse these trends are urgently needed. There's a steady increase in the publications uh, observed, especially over the last decade, 
but the ratio of African-led versus non-African lead has shown little variance over the last 30 years. Utilization of ethnopharmacology as well as acceptance of care by traditional healers was prominent in the studies that were included. Under-researched areas identified included epilepsy in women, epilepsy surgery, genetics, as well as diagnostics, including EEG and neuroimaging. Predominance of descriptive studies with few systematic reviews, no randomized controlled trials or clinical trials observed. Unique African conditions we observed can be explored from bench to bedside, resulting in effective interventional studies, as well as real change in clinical practice and positive impact for affected populations. So epilepsy research in Africa is largely unfunded or underfunded, contributing to the low output as well as predominance of descriptive studies. So the recommendations were that um, specific regions and countries are at present leaders in epilepsy research, and therefore they could represent the research hubs and focal areas that would be pivotal in upscaling epilepsy research in the future. There's a need to have an improvement in research training as well as research capacity building to foster improved outcomes in research. We also need to have a strengthening of the collaborations across both across Africa as well as internationally, which would lead to innovative as well as effective outcomes for epilepsy research. Collaborations would also be learning and training opportunities that could help build capacity in African centers. Region-specific genetic studies are required given the genetic diversity that is evident in Africa. This would foster precision-driven management on the continent. Again, continental training of uh, neurologists as well as scientists to promote retention and uh, advocacy for patients is required. And this would also help improve patient outcomes as well as epilepsy research outcomes. We need improved focus on epilepsy research in women, children, and the elderly. Joint funding projects should also be promoted. And the leads for these studies need to come from Africa. The focus of these studies also needs to be relevant to the needs of the continent. So thank you very much for your attention. Pauline, thank you. That was such a beautiful overview. Um, I meant to say at the beginning, for people listening, there's a Q&A section. Please put questions or comments in the Q&A. Type them in and we'll then relay them to Pauline and the other panelists. Um, I, I would just like to maybe start the questions with, Pauline, what do you think the barriers are to um, interventional studies and high quality research in our setting? Well, um, I think first and foremost, it's about the expertise. Sometimes you have to have been involved in certain things. For instance, uh, clinical trials, you'll notice that um, quite a number of institutions are just beginning to create clinical research units that can carry out clinical trials. So if you haven't been part of uh, that kind of interventional study, then it becomes, it's not so easy to do it. Uh, again, also the resources, but first and foremost, let's say the skills and the experience, yeah. So I ho I'm hopeful that um, in future, days and uh, you know, in coming months that um, should we have collaborations, for instance, if a center up in the high income areas is running a study and they would like to probably understand how an investigation of product or even just varying the dose of an already known anti-seizure medication works in the African population and they involve the center in Africa, then that way, in the future, it becomes easier for a center like that to run an interventional study. So I think that uh, first and foremost, lack of expertise, lack of experience, 
and probably uh, you know kind of superficial collaborations. We probably could do better with uh, deeper con collaborations going forward. We need to build trust and reliability uh, in our research approach. Thank you, Pauline. Uh, Richard, you had a, a comment. Sure. Uh, yeah, um, can you hear me? Just want to check my yes. microphone, actually. Just, okay. just briefly introduce yourself because you've popped up. Oh, uh, sure. Sorry. Um, well, good evening, everyone. It's lovely to be here. Um, so I'm a medical doctor. I trained in Cape Town. Um, it seems like a while back now. Um, and then I came across to Oxford and I've been doing a PhD in, in basic science for the last few years, and I'm in the process of writing it up. Um, and my research interest has kind of stemmed from clinical research all the way through to fundamental neuroscience or with a kind of an epilepsy uh, focus. Um, so I've, I've worked quite closely with Joe Wilms, who's looking at um, the status of epilepticus and, and the clinical presentation of that and also the management of that within in a resource, uh, resource uh, limited setting. Um, and then I've been trying to translate some of that uh, clinical insights into, into um, the, the lab and trying to work out why some patients, particularly children, don't respond to benzos when we give them to them to manage their status. So that's kind of a broad picture of my, my research interest. So I can speak a little bit to the clinical and a little bit to the basic science. Um, and I'm kind of awkwardly positioned between those two. Uh, Pauline, I, I, I really loved your talk and, and I just wanted to maybe make a point and also ask this question around this because it's certainly something I picked up having now been in, in, um, in Europe and in the kind of first world setting, if you will, and watched how research has been done here. Um, and that's around ownership of the research. So it's, it's all very well around, you know, you can run a massive clinical trial in Africa, but if, if Africa is not taking ownership of that, it's almost kind of lost. Um, and, and to give the, kind of an example of this, or to, to, to make a case um, scenario of it rather, is that if we wanted to run a, a clinical trial on phenobarb, and Joe knows that I'm kind of interested in, in maybe doing this, if the funding comes from abroad, typically what happens is the, the lead authors are from abroad as well. And so the paper comes out and it ends up in the New England Journal and everyone's super excited. But the first and the last author are based in the US or they're based in the UK or they're based in Europe. And so when you want to apply for a grant to do another trial, if you're not the first author or the last author, you don't really take the massive amounts of credit which you need to track the funding agencies. Um, and I, I, this is really kind of problematic because it's almost a kind of an abuse of the, the tremendous resource that Africa does have in, in clinical research. And I think that's a, that's a challenge. And I'm kind of interested to know how, um, or what your thoughts are on that and how one could take better ownership of the research that's done in Africa, because it's, it's very attractive having international colleagues um, but there's a, there's a tight line between being taken advantage of um, and that kind of almost perpetuates the cycle of not being able to generate more funds and do high quality research within Africa. Yeah, thanks Richard. Uh, you have the advantage of uh, looking at the problem from both sides or having the experience you know, from one side to the other. And it's actually a multifaceted problem. Yes, I talked about not having had, uh, you know, uh, exposure, experience, and all that. So one of the first problems, uh, Richard, is that we've got hundreds and hundreds of children with epilepsy and not enough people to take care of them. So in the time that's left over, first and foremost, what I'm saying is we need to have enough people to take care of these children. Why? So that uh, we can kind of share the burden and there is time left over for quality teaching and quality research. Then again, if you don't have people who are even trained and looking at these children and you know, interested in the research piece, then it, it's a bit of a problem. Then secondly, it's also about advocacy. And actually that was the crux of this study. We needed to understand where we are at and we needed to put it out there so that anybody else who you know, looks at it and is needing a leg to stand on, so to speak, can use this data or use this paper or the findings of our research to say, look, this is what is going on and this is where we need to go. So it's true, we need to advocate for ourselves. We need to advocate for our populations. We need to own our research agenda, as you say. So um, this looks back at 30 years from 2019. And I'm hopeful that uh, as we see things picking up going forward, when we look back again in 20 years from now, things will be different. I agree with you. Pauline, thank really you very advocate. much. <laughs> thank you very much. And Richard, that was a great point. So I think having stirred everybody up and hopefully getting you all eager to ask more questions, that kind of 
closing question leads beautifully into the next presentation, which is going to be done by Professor Charles Newton. So Charles has over 30 years of experience conducting studies on the epilepsies and other neurological disorders in sub-Saharan Africa. He's professor of psychiatry in the University of Oxford with special interest in global neurodevelopmental disorders. And he's conducting research on epidemiology and psychiatric comorbidities of epilepsy in sub-Saharan Africa, especially trying to find solutions for the treatment gap and addressing stigma. And he's gonna tell us about the epidemiology research in epilepsy and some lessons learned, some really salient points. So I'm handing over to Charles now. Hello. Um, Joe has asked me to talk to you about epidemiology research of epilepsy in Africa, uh, based upon our experience uh, principally um, in Khalifi, Kenya, but also um, in the informal settlements of Nairobi and also uh, Tanzania, South Africa and Ghana. So why is epidemiological research needed in Africa? Well, firstly, the burden of epilepsy is much higher in Africa than elsewhere. The burden being measured by the epidemiological parameters such as prevalence, incidence, mortality and spontaneous remission. The disability associated with the epilepsy in terms of comorbid conditions such as psychiatric comorbidity, but also um, the burns um, that result as a result of epilepsy and the stigma associated with epilepsy in many communities both in rural and in urban communities. A reduction in the mortality of epilepsy will lead to an increase um, in epilepsy um, in many of these areas. What is important to note is that most people in Africa with epilepsy live in resource poor areas with limited access to healthcare services. And therefore there's an imperative to improve the health of these poor populations um, in this context. Also in Africa, we're lucky in that we have unique conditions associated with epilepsy, such as nodding syndrome, which Richard will um, talk to about later the, during this session. And there are also unique opportunities. So what is the public health significance um, of epilepsy in resource poor areas of Africa? Well, the prevalence and the incidence is higher than elsewhere. And the severity of epilepsy um, is also more um, is greater, um, particularly because the poor healthcare systems and the increase in the um, treatment gap. There's a lack of awareness of epilepsy in this context, uh, making the community aware that epilepsy is a controllable and treatable condition um, is particularly important. But there are also quite severe consequences um, for households, in particularly um, poverty and uh, insecurity in terms of violence, that occurs in many of the communities um, which are in resource poor areas, for example, informal settlements of the urban um, cities. The psychosocial impact that it has on the family um, in the context of um, anxiety and stress, and also the financial um, difficulties that many households with people with epilepsy have in terms of uh, paying for extra um, hospital attendances, both in terms of the transport and also the um, attendance itself, and also the fact that that person may not be able to work fully and support um, other members of the household. So these have higher frequency in vulnerable populations. So who are the, the vulnerable populations? Well, these are mainly people with diminished capacity for decision making. They include intellectual disability, which is often associated with epilepsy. There may be transient effects of cognitive function in people with epilepsy, either due to the seizures themselves or depression, psychosis and drug abuse. Of course, children have diminished capacity um, and fetus in terms of their exposure to teratogenic effects of anti-seizure medication, such as sodium valproate. But there are other concerns, for example, differentiating between the concept of research in different cultural contexts um, and that of, um, of clinical care. There is um, adolescent ascent in which um, adults are often um, uh, may be seen to be coercing adolescents to be involved in studies when they do not want to be them involved themselves. 
Um, and also undue coercion in poor people, uh, give, for example, giving cash to attend epilepsy um, appointments as part of the study, or prisoners which are a captive population. So we find that consent is often given um, by uh, parents or relatives um, and legal guardians um, who may not take into consideration some of the um, consequences of being unable for the individuals being unable to take uh, to make decisions about that, whether they want to be involved in the studies. There are tests that are able to assess the um, decision making capacity of individuals. There are really five elements which need to be taken into consideration when planning um, epilepsy studies. First of all, how does the um, epilepsy study um, fit in with the system that is already present and how will it improve the system in terms of um, improving the care of people with epilepsy. Stakeholders participation, participation is particularly important um, in the context of if the stakeholders are not involved and are not on board, then there'll be no sustainability to the project. Accountability to the local community um, that you are focusing and that you are studying things that they are think are important is also um, critically important to think about. We must all strive for evidence-based interventions um, and many of the epidemiological result, res, research will lead to identification of things that we can intervene with and um, to reduce the burden of epilepsy. And these particularly give rise to innovation innovative evaluations and um, interventions. So before describing some of the epi um, epidemiological research, I just want to get some of the definitions clear. So the incidence is the number of new cases per period of time, and it is a rate. It's like it is, as you could uh, suggest, it is a um, an inflow into a dam of disease. The prevalence is the number of cases per population and represents, if you like, the water level um, of the dam. It is a ratio. Um, people often say um, a prevalence rate, but that is not, um, that's not by definition, it is a ratio or a proportion. And then the mortality um, or fatality is the number of deaths per population. This may be expressed both as a um, proportion or as a rate. And remission or recovery is also the number of cases who no longer have the disease, um, and they may be expressed as a proportion or a rate. In a meta-analysis that Anthony Ngugi did, um, um, he found that the global burden of disease in 2010 was in the order of about 69 million. But what was particularly important was, first of all, that the prevalence of epilepsy um, was um, double that in resource poor countries compared to resource rich countries. And it was particularly um, higher in rural areas compared to urban areas and um, within the resource poor countries. But there was in this um, meta-analysis, there was considerable heterogeneity, which was accounted for by the country development and also the sample size. There was also considerably heterogeneity in the incident studies. And as you can see, there are very few incident studies conducted in low and middle income countries, mainly because these are very difficult to do and are very expensive. However, the um, range of the incidents was considerable um, in this context. This is an old slide taken um, from a textbook, but what it does illustrate are two important points. First of all, that the incidence of epilepsy um, is very high in children in high income countries. And this has been replicated um, in many studies that we've conducted in Africa. Secondly, the, most, the other important point is that there is an increase in incidence um, in older populations. And this is becoming particularly important um, in the context of Africa because people are living longer and are uh, developing, are therefore more prone to developing stroke um, and other conditions such as dementia, which are associated um, with epilepsy. There's also an increase in mortality. This is a systematic review conducted by um, a Tanzanian co colleague, Francis uh, Leverer, um, and showed that the, um, the standardized mortality ratio um, is about twice that um, compared to the um, 
um, the SMR in high income countries. But there are also unique opportunities for conducting um, epidemiological research in, um, of epilepsy in Africa. First of all, there are large numbers for the epidemiological studies, and this gives rise to greater precision um, and also the identification of important risk factors. There's a higher incidence of risk factors, um, which may be intervened and may be stopped. There are uh, unique risk factors, for example, malaria has now been associated with the development of epilepsy. And there's also consistent, um, considerable genetic heterogeneity, which may provide um, insights into the genetic basis of epilepsies um, in, in Africa, but also um, may give rise to research um, which may identify um, drugs which are particularly important for treating epilepsies um, in um, Africa. However, the infrastructure's resources are often poor. Um, this is particularly due to um, for fundamental or basic research where uh, university departments uh, do not have the facilities to conduct uh, or the personnel or the expertise to conduct these research. There has been a rap rapid increase in some resources, for example, mass spectroscopy and sequencing um, of the genome in many institutions um, in Africa. There are also um, poor resources in terms of um, the clinical research, electroencephalography, um, EEG. Um, although there are many EEG machines in Africa, the difficulty here is that they're often not inter the EEG is not interpreted um, well. Neuroimaging, such as MRI scans, which are particularly important for epilepsy, um, are um, are becoming more widely available in um, Africa, but they're often in private facilities and thus are out of the reach of um, poor communities um, and research projects. And there are a development of event related um, poten event potential laboratories. There are now three potential such laboratories in Kenya, for example. But there's also barriers to accessing or obtaining these equipment. These are not available locally, therefore they have to import, uh, have to be imported. And this means that they are often um, blocked due to import restrictions or delayed um, in the clearing houses. And one of the biggest difficulty is the lack of expertise in maintaining equipment. For example, there's no point in buying an MRI scan if you do not have a maintenance contract as well. Um, and the lack of expertise um, for the technicians to maintain the, um, the equipment is particularly problematical. There are considerable um, ethical issues as well um, across Africa. The difficulty in the constitution of the institutional research board and making sure that they have the necessary expertise to appraise the um, proposals. I've already mentioned about the concept of informed consent um, and difference between research and clinical care. And also the consideration that the benefits to participants may be particularly important um, since um, they, um, since they, so some, in some, some, some studies, for example, genetic studies, the research participants may not benefit directly from, um, from research. Um, and also there is often a discrepancy of care in people who are participating in the study versus the people of epilepsy who are not participating in the study. And also the duration of care after the project ends, the sustainability of the project. There are other issues such as capacity building, uh, the intellectual property rights for new medicines and for genetic insights that may come about. And there is a real danger of exploitation in conducting research which, uh, which would not be possible in high income countries uh, due to either the lack of numbers um, or due to, for example, the unique conditions that are found in many um, African countries. And it is particularly important to be aware that, um, that some of the research may benefit patients in high income countries, but will not be sustainable um, in um, in low and middle income countries. So what about epidemiological studies? Well, this the most common one is the passive case defining of, um, of people with epilepsy, but this um, underestimates the actual um, number. This commonly occurs when you look at hospital based data. The difficulty with this um, is that you are not accessing all the population um, within the area that are considerable. 
and they may not be accessing the um, hospitals because of stigma, misconceptions and beliefs um, about epilepsy, difficulties with uh, transport, poverty or lack of awareness that they have epilepsy. So by far the most robust way is active case detec detection, which is usually conducted in two stages. One, a screening stage, screening with a questionnaire, and then a confirmation by a clinician, preferably by a neurologist. Screening tools have been developed across Africa. They are rapid and low cost. Um, some of them have sensitivity up to 98% um, for convulsive epilepsies with specificity of 92%. Most of them are done through door-to-door -door surveys um, or complemented by um, key informant methods and information from other sources such as medical registries. So what needs to be done? Well, first of all, before starting off um, epidemiological search, it's critically important to engage with the local communities, determine what they think needs to be done about the condition, raise the awareness of epilepsy within the community, and design the study in collaboration with the local communities and have a community advisory board. Why is it necessary to conduct this project in this area? Will it answer the relevant, relevant questions, both from a scientific point of view, but also from a community point of view? And then to bring the team together, get the ex expertise, both from the local, um, but also national and international. And what is critically important is to engage with a statistician early in order to work out the sample size. One needs to start design the studies um, with specific aims and appropriate sample sizes. There are many studies which have been published which do not have um, a sufficient sample sizes in order to um, provide any meaningful information. Determine the feasibility of conducting the study. How many people are going to be needed from the search point of view and also from a clinical point of view? Is it going to be possible to do it within the time frame? And is the funding sufficient to cover the costs of the project? Preparation research is critical and important. It is important, for example, to choose the time period according to local uh, conditions. For example, re avoid rainy season uh, for field studies or periods of when elections are going to occur. It's particularly important to pilot the questionnaires um, and process the samples and setting up the machines for collecting the data. And this all preparation before the start, study actually starts. Ensure that there's sufficient electricity to supply computers and machines because you can lose data from uh, power cuts and such like. And to create timeline te templates to track the research, preferably on a week by week basis. When the study is ready to be and the ethical permission has um, been achieved, uh, obtained um, and the community has been um, engaged um, and our, our agreement starts low and build up recruitment monitor the participants or the recruitment of participants on a spreadsheet. Again, preferably on this on a daily basis. Clean the data on a daily basis. There's nothing worse than having a whole batch of data which you find discrepancies on and you have to go back to the participants many months later. Um, review on a weekly basis the data collected over the last several days and back up the data definitely on a daily basis on multiple slides, sites clouds um, and uh, external hard disk drives. When the data, when the study is finished, the most important thing is clean, clean and clean the data. Poor data leads to poor research and invalid research. Use rain checks and identify outliers. Look for inconsistencies. Cleaning data is critical for producing good research. Have a predetermined um, analysis plan in consultation with the statistician and avoid uh, speculative secondary analysis because this will lead to erroneous conclusions. And when the research is completed, um, prepare summaries of the research for the local community and media release. Prepare results for presentation to local regional and national organizations and scientific uh, meetings. And then of course, as researchers, um, one of the things that we're judged by is the um, scientific papers. So prepare and publish the results. Even the negative results should be published in scientific papers to avoid other people conducting similar studies or providing a comparison with other sites. 
So in terms of dissemination, one of the, some of the barriers for researchers in Africa include language. Um, most papers um, are written in English um, or French, and this impedes, uh, this is not your first language, this impedes publication in international journals. There's also a lack of exposure to research in many undergraduate degrees. There's lack of technical knowledge. Having protected time to conduct research, many researchers um, in Africa have an immense burden of administration, teaching and clinical um, time, which interferes, which will take away um, from the time um, from research. And in particular, some of the brightest researchers I've known are put into positions of a lot of responsibility too early and therefore are not able to develop their scientific careers um, in an appropriate manner. There's obviously there's poor pay in many research institutions and this needs to be addressed. There is um, the concept that people are favoured and um, nepotism, that people are favoured um, over above another um, and this needs to be stamped out. And then there's also the fact of taking on too many projects, um, because if you're a successful researcher um, in Africa, you will be approached by many different projects and the ability to say no is particularly important. Accessing funding resources. In many African countries, um, the government doesn't provide very much funding for researchers and therefore we have to go towards international organisations such as those in North America and in Europe. Um, what is important is to ensure um, that the proposals are well written and well thought out because they are all, these are all very competitive. But there's also a poss possibility of approaching pharma for some studies, but one must be aware of the conflict of interest in this concept. And what is in particularly important, I think, is a stronger res support for researchers at more advanced levels so that they are are continued to work within African institutions and also support for return of established dis diaspora scientists um, in order to get their expertise back into the into the countries and looking for the most talented researchers um, from other institutions in the world to attract them to um, research into epilepsy and neurosciences. So in conclusion epilepsy is a major burden in Africa there's an urgent need to conduct ethical, appropriate research um, on epilepsy and other neuro neuroscience disorders to find solutions which are applicable in these settings. And we should use this as an opportunity to strengthen the capacity of research in terms of local personnel and infrastructure and develop collaborative uh, partnerships. Thank you very much. That was such a fantastic presentation from Charles. Vivian, um, I'd just like to hand over to you to uh, uh, thread some of the panel discussion, maybe with Richard Idro. All right. Um, let's see. Um, thank you so much uh, re uh, for this uh, talk that you gave. Um, and again, I want to comment and say that you raised very key issues in um, trying to make sure we create good data. Um, entering the data and checking the data on a daily basis is a very good um, pointer for people. Um, any questions from elsewhere? I don't see any questions. Not we're getting everybody being very quiet how they're entering. Richard, yeah. what's been your experience with you to some of the done some of these big studies? And uh, I know you've worked with Charles. Um, um two, two areas the bit about uh, data is a really serious one. Um, many things can can go wrong. Um, and unsteady electricity supplies where you are, the, de the data centers can mess you up big, big time. Um, the other one is the quality of data, the checking, checking the quality. We have had problems earlier, um, especially where you are using specific tools. And some of these tools may be uh, specialized and um, 
if you do not have the quality of what is being entered or what data you are collecting, you may either be collecting inadequate material or over um, collecting it so much, including unnecessary material. Really, it helps uh, with the quality of tech, which you do as uh, periodically as you go on with the, with the data collection. The other one is with the data transfers. So interchanges, now increasingly, at least the institutions are having um, either cloud backups or central locations. But until recently, this, this was quite a challenge. So working with institutions which can provide this and support the research groups in doing this um, is uh, especially the universities, uh, the computer science institutes within the universities can help uh, can help support this. But sometimes, as um, either as doctors or scientists, sometimes we are not uh, aware about the availability of some of these uh, uh, resources, and uh, sharing with other groups also is another possibility. But a lot of it is really around data. Right. Thank you very much, Dr. Richard. Um, maybe to ask um, how to deal with um, enforcing um, delays, like we're going through the COVID-19 situation. And I'm sure a lot of, 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 of studies have had major impacts for, right from beginning of IRB to data collection and the number of, of uh, recruitment. Um, how have you dealt with this uh, situation? Um, not only unseen, um, unforeseen delays, but also costs have, have shot up incredibly. Um, so let, let me just start with um, the periods of lockdown. You have people, for example, on the intervention studies, you have started them on an, an intervention and uh, then the lockdowns appear. Somehow you have to find a way of delivering drugs to them, um, uh, delivering drugs to, to, to these people, because and, uh, stopping the intervention is it's unthinkable. It, it, it just has to, to happen. Trying to find all these barriers that you should deliver it to, with, um, with social distancing, even public transport, the number of people sitting in public transport had uh, to uh, reduce, so the cost of bus fares increased uh, dramatically. Um, the Arab set uh, sat less frequently until people adapted to online uh, meetings. Um, really, there was there are so many challenges, so many different things which we had to adapt. Even the staff working, um, people had to start um, doing some staff working from home, taking. In increasingly using the phone to, to take patient data. And so much so that um, I think in many institutions, and now we have almost migrated to electronic data uh, collection. Um, also with the safety of <laughs> this, the safety of the paper, so that no, not so many people are able to handle paper in the epidemiological service. So whoever, the research assistant just goes with a tablet. So many of these transitions have had to be made over the last two or so years. Right. Thank you very much. Over to you, Joe. Thank you. I, I just I'm so excited that we've got some questions coming up in the group. Um, so Richard, just um, re um, re unmute yourself. There's one in particular, which is what do you think can be done to encourage African governments to fund local research? Um, right now, I don't think there is um, there is uh, the, the COVID nineteen epidemic was just enough to open their eyes, and um, I know two governments, the one of Kenya and South Africa, were already miles ahead um, um, in the, in um, in funding research, but uh, now a number of governments have actually taken it up. Uh, so many of them are um, engaging in uh, supporting pharmaceutical processes, um, uh, supporting building the pharmaceutical industry. Um, I know in Uganda, um, um, a research fund has been opened for, for universities. It is not great, 
but it is it's actually available for this. They're offering competitive uh, research grants. Um, I, th I think the change, the change is coming. Um, it may take a while um, to, to increase in, in size, uh, but um, I think the lessons which were learned during the the COVID, um, the COVID epidemic really opened the number of government eyes. I know Rwanda is uh, doing quite a lot of work uh, of making funds available. Uh, Nigeria and Ghana have really made lots of funds available to different institutions. I, I think uh, it is going to change. I think the future is is brighter. Uh, they they just need encouragement. Um, as, as scientists, that we provide meaningful research which inform the decisions which the government made, and then we make ourselves relevant. That way, I think they'll provide the, the funds, funds will come. Thank you, Richard. And I think the other initiative is with the IGAP process happening. We're going to have a lot more capacity for lobbying and advocacy as uh, as this gets uh, these resolutions get get passed. Um, just we're just going to move on to the next speaker, but just to reassure that uh, Mayeso will contact um, Prof Newton and ask him for a link to the consent uh, form that you're asking for the patient's ability to provide consent, and we'll get that linked up on the um, league site. So please watch out for that because all of these recordings will be recorded there. And um, uh, Charnez and Adam, we will uh, defer back to your questions. Thank you um, after the uh, next presentation. Thank you very much. So it, it's really with great pleasure that I introduce the next speaker. And we're now delving into the field of basic science. So this is Dr. Joe Raimondo, who's a very rare uh, breed. He's a senior lecturer in the Division of Cell Biology in the Department of Human uh, uh, Biology at the University of Cape Town and affiliated to the Neurosciences Institute. And Joe's a neuroscientist uh, and he investigates brain function and dysfunction and he uses electrophysiology optical imaging and computer computational approaches to do this. So he says his career ambition is to produce outstanding research for local and global relevance whilst developing African capacity in cellular neurophysiology and computational neuroscience. And his primary aim of his research has been to understand why do brain seize, which is something I think we'd all like to know. So uh, without ado, um, I'd like uh, Joe's talk to, to come up. Thank you, uh, Jess and Gus. Hello everyone, uh, my apologies for uh, not being able to be with you live, uh, so uh, I'm going to give a, a pre-recorded talk and I'll be talking about uh, developing uh, uh, really basic science research uh, with some clinical relevance uh, and essentially how to set up a, a basic science lab uh, in, in a resource limited setting. Uh, so I hope you find it interesting. So I uh, am based at the University of Cape Town, uh, in, uh, which is, as you might imagine, uh, in Cape Town. Uh, we're at the foot of this uh, beautiful table mountain. And this is where I run a neuroscience lab where we study cellular mechanisms uh, in epilepsy. And uh, uh, the first thing I should probably admit is that uh, Whilst we are resource limited relative uh, to the rest of the world, uh, I think it's worth acknowledging that UCT is certainly better off than um, a lot of other uh, African uh, institutes and universities, uh, but hopefully some of my insights will still uh, be useful. Yeah, so I'm going to uh, talk about challenges that are faced by Africans starting uh, basic neuroscience labs. Uh, I hope you are, um, I'll be able to explain some opportunities and helpful strategies that I've found and some tips and potential mistakes to avoid. And then I'm going to give you some very brief examples of uh, some of the things we've done in our lab. And all of that hopefully in 20 minutes. So the first thing to say is that starting a lab is just uh, extremely, uh, extremely difficult. Uh, and it's especially hard uh, in Africa. And why is that? Uh, and I think you, you will really know all of these things already. It's just uh, a major, major issue of, of uh, 
lack of finances, lack of uh, financial support from our institutions in terms of salaries and equipment, uh, funding, local funding agencies in African countries are uh, really quite restricted in what they're able to offer. Uh, then there's like human capacity challenges. You know, we have very little time to actually do research. We've had the heavy clinical teaching and administrative loads. Uh, some of our students haven't been particularly well trained, especially as there's no undergraduate training programs in neuroscience. And this is often this lack of institutional support to, uh, to manage complex grants that you may want to receive from overseas. There's obviously huge logistical and bureaucratic challenges for being in Africa in terms of ordering things, uh, uh, the time delays involved trying to get them through customs can just sometimes be impossible and getting lost in bureaucratic mazes and that can be very demoralizing and then there's also the challenge of just sort of not being as connected to the global scientific enterprise uh, you don't know what the new exciting things are people may not recognize you um, it's just a little bit more difficult being uh, being slightly removed from where things are happening and obviously you may train good students and, and they leave for greener pastures uh, so that's also tough and then they're often just I guess more subtle barriers that are inherent to these sort of the inequities of north-south relationships uh, where perhaps uh, groups in, uh, in Africa and sub-saharan Africa particularly or feel like they're they're only used for things like clinical trials etc uh, with all that said, uh, I would say that uh, there has never been a better time to be a scientist in Africa. So despite these challenges, um, it's only got better and I believe will only continue to get better. So what are some uh, opportunities and helpful strategies? Uh, and in terms of financial opportunities, uh, particularly in this current economic climate, things are just exceptionally tough. But, um, you know, over time, economies will grow uh, and more and more options will be available. There are some uh, wonderful institutions like the African Academy of Sciences, UK Royal Society, and MRC, and German DFG, Welcome, and others, USNIH, the ILAE, which is organizing this, and EBRO all uh, do their bit to try and support um, scientific research, particularly uh, um, those last ones in, in neuroscience and uh, epilepsy. Uh, some opportunities there with regards to travel grants and summer schools. Talk about summer schools. We've organized the summer school uh, on epilepsy before, uh, and uh, you might recognize some faces. There's me, there's Joe, uh, and uh, there's Richard, who will uh, log on for uh, the uh, uh, to answer some questions at the end of this. Uh, so that was an epilepsy school. We also run annual computational neuroscience school. Uh, which uh, is trying to develop uh, computational neuroscience capacity in Africa. So there's schools uh, and some limited travel grants. Uh, and so those are really valuable for learning new techniques. And I guess much more importantly, for establishing uh, relationships with, with other students and with instructors, which can be extremely helpful. Uh, okay. Uh, so I guess with COVID and uh, increasing the use of um, online technologies, it's a little bit easier. It's not the same as being able to walk next door and chat to someone, but using Skype and Zoom and WhatsApp, it's a lot easier to stay in touch, plan grants and, and publications with collaborators. And uh, using things like Twitter and Google Scholar, it's really just a, so much easier to at least have your finger on the pulse of what's happening in terms of research, which, which helps a, uh, a great deal and is much easier now than it was, say, uh, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, I find this slide uh, being incredibly useful for for scientists uh, in the developing world context. You know, there are now courses that you can do, these massive online courses. Some of the best courses are now easily accessible on Coursera. You can get any publication anywhere immediately, either if someone's published it on a preprint of bioarchive or mid-archive on open access, uh, or uh, you can use Sci-Hub. And I put the link here to your sci so you can get any journal article uh, absolutely immediately. You can get any textbook you want using that link over there. Um, uh, and so really, we've got all the access to knowledge. Um, and 
despite being in Africa. And increasingly, more and more data is being made available in terms of open source publications, but uh, other big projects like the Human Brain Project, Allen Brain Institute, uh, more and more RNA-seq data sets are being put online. So there's more and more data being put online, and it's a challenge about how to use it. Uh, there's also open software with people making their, their software free. Um, we use all these programs in our research. Um, Python is taking over scientific computing, and that's all open source. And there's open hardware where the, the movement to try and make your own lab equipment uh, at a fraction of the price of commercial uh, equipment is, is, is growing. There's lots of openware websites, open hardware websites. And as an example, uh, I'll show you, we made something called Open Spritzer. So we wanted to be able to deliver very small volumes, picoliter volumes of neurotransmitters or other things to study uh, synaptic transmission during seizures. But these devices cost a lot, over $3,000. So we um, we made our own version, which we originally called the Puff Adder before calling it the Open Spritzer. And really, uh, it's uh, just a little control circuit for a valve uh, that opens and closes with a little voltage pulse. Uh, and this worked extremely well. And we put all the instructions on how to make it uh, online in this paper over here. Um, so it's an open hardware pressure ejection system where you can really deliver very tiny volumes. And here you can see it working. We are recording from a neuron and we're puffing picoliter volumes of glutamate. And every time we puff glutamate, our neuron fires an action potential or we could puff GABA and uh, inhibit action potential generation. So uh, that was a useful little piece of equipment we built, an example of open hardware being useful. We also used it to inject a bit of adenovirus carrying a gene to express a calcium indicator. Here you can see us using the open spritzer to inject it into a little hippocampal brain slice. And when we did that and we put it under a microscope, all our neurons were expressing um, this calcium indicator, GCAM6. And in this video that we took um, using quite a fancy microscope that was uh, expensive and custom uh, commercially bought, that must be said, you can see uh, the onset of a seizure. So these are neurons that light up when they're active. And you can see as the seizure starts, all of the neurons uh, are partaking in the seizure. So it's a, a, a beautiful image of what is happening in in the brain during a seizure or this part of the brain during a seizure. Okay, so what are some tips and potential mistakes to avoid if anyone out there planning on setting up or doing some basic research? Uh, and something that may seem obvious, but really just bears repeating that relationships are everything. Your relationships with your students, with your colleagues and, and collaborators are just the most important thing to nurture. You, you can't afford to ne ne neglect these or burn bridges, no matter how tempting that might be. So, uh, yeah, try be someone that others really enjoy working with. And uh, this, this is just super important to enabling your career and that of that of uh, that of others. Uh, then, really, you need to think really carefully about what you want to spend your time and your money working on, because you have limited uh, amounts of both of those. And there will be lots of people coming up to you really excited about the latest thing that they're really into, and they want to get you to collaborate on or use your latest technique to study. Um, so you really need to try stay focused. Um, don't try spend all your money on what you think is the fanciest thing. I, I've done this before. Try to do simple things that you understand well. Sometimes computational or theoretical work can be really cheap uh, because you know, it doesn't cost much to uh, use a computer. And try find a niche that is really fundable in the African context. Uh, and, uh, and then you know, once you're funded, you can do that work, but also just grow your capability to, to, to explore more generally. Um, and it's worth saying that the quality of the work in your lab is only as good as your students. So you need to be really selective in the type of people you recruit and how you nurture them. And yeah, try try and maintain ownership of the projects you work on. It's very um, collaboration is good, but uh, if you need if you want to be fundable in the long term, you need to develop a research niche for yourself. Okay, so with that, uh, some some advice. Uh, I'm going to uh, just spend uh, a few brief moments.
talking about some example research from our lab in Cape Town. Uh, and uh, yeah, the, the first uh, thing to say is that you know, we work on epilepsy. And uh, as you know, during, a, during normal activity states in the brain, broadly speaking, excitation and inhibition are matched at, at a population level. So neurons can fire action potentials and encode all the thoughts and memories that uh, make life so wonderful. But uh, during a seizure, for some reason, uh, all the neurons start firing synchronously at the same time. And there's either reduced inhibition or enhanced excitation. Something's gone wrong in the network to cause a seizure. But under this state, uh, our brains are unable to function normally, and this is extremely debilitating. So we're really interested in what are the, the mechanisms that kind of uh, cause this to happen? Um, what reduces inhibition or uh, what are the processes that might affect cells to change the structure of neuronal networks to make them more susceptible to seizures? Uh, neurocystis psychosis is one of the diseases we study, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But we in the lab use different experimental approaches. We use patch clamp electrophysiology, where we put electrodes onto neurons to record the activity. Uh, we use fluorescence microscopy to be able to look at the, uh, the beautiful morphological structure of neurons and, and, and see their activity using things like calcium indicators. And we do some computational modeling too. A student of mine at what we call a patch clamp rig, where you use these little robotic arms to gently lower electrodes onto neurons so we can record the electrical activity and study the property, properties of circuits during, during seizures, amongst other things. Okay, so these are two little example snippets I'll talk about. The first is uh, the, a possible mechanism for like the sudden onset or acute generation of seizures by tapeworm larvae uh, in neurosis psychosis. This is one idea we have about this. And then other stories about uh, GABAergic signaling in the brain becoming excitatory during seizures and how this might be relevant to benzodiazepine resistance in status epilepticus. Okay, so uh, you may know that um, neurosis psychosis is a very common cause of uh, acquired epilepsy thought to be one of the most common causes of, of adult acquired epilepsy in the world. And uh, it is caused by the uh, ingestion, the accidental ingestion of eggs uh, uh, of the, the cestode by humans. And the eggs sort of mistakenly think they're inside a pig and they develop into cysts in various tissues, but have a particular predilection for the brain. You can see some uh, larvae embedded in the brain of the patient with neurocystis and the most common uh, symptom are all seizures. Now, it's it's well known that uh, patients are typically asymptomatic for very long periods of time with uh, viable larvae in, in their brains, and that inflammation plays a very important role uh, in the disease. Uh, that said, uh, we wanted to see if there were any factors in the larvae themselves that actually could um, maybe excite neurons if, say, the, neuron, the larvae released substances or suddenly died and released lots of substances. So we took related uh, cestote necrasiceps, homogenized them, and just very simply used our, our open spritzer that I explained to you before that can deliver small volumes. We, we just little puffs of this tapeworm, mushed up tapeworm larvae onto neurons while we recorded the activity with a patch clamp electrode. And what you can see here is that when we puff the homogenous either onto mouse brain cells or rat brain cells, and we've done the same on human brain cells, when we puff the homogenous, we can cause a depolarization. And if we puff enough, we can really excite these neurons and trigger action potentials. So something about this homogenous is excitatory to neurons. And uh, here's some calcium imaging of the, the uh, type I showed you before, where we're puffing some homogenous, and you can see as we puff, it excites all the neurons. And uh, sometimes if we puff, the activity can actually spread throughout the slice, causing uh, a seizure-like event. So this really demonstrates that uh, the homogenous of, of these larvae, if you can really um, excite neurons and trigger epileptiform activity, and, and perhaps this is, is, is relevant uh, in neurosis and psychosis. OK, 
Okay, so the last thing I'm going to tell you about in the, in the next two minutes is a little uh, story or uh, piece of work that we've been doing on excited tree gabagic signaling. So the first thing to say is that uh, in synaptic inhibition in the brain, fast synaptic inhibition uh, is predominantly mediated by GABA-A receptors. And uh, these receptors uh, become permeable to chloride ions when GABA binds to them. So typically what happens is GABA binds to the GABA-A receptor, chloride moves down its concentration gradient um, into the uh, electrochemical gradient into the, into the cell or the neuron. And because these ions are negative, it makes it slightly more negative inside and that uh, hyperpolarizes or makes the membrane potential of neurons more negative. Uh, but uh, what's what's worth uh, knowing and which is seldom appreciated is that action is dependent on the concentration gradient of chloride across the membrane. So if you had slightly more chloride to begin with, when GABA binds, fewer chloride ions will move in and you'll get a smaller hyperpolarization, a slightly weaker inhibitory effect. But you can imagine a case where there's so much chloride inside a neuron for some reason that when GABA binds, instead of going into the neuron, chloride actually flows out, causing a, a, a build up a positive charge because negative ions are leaving. And that actually causes the membrane potential to go more positive, sort of opposite effect to what people normally think. Uh, and so with this in mind, uh, previous research of ours has shown that during seizure-like events, at least in, in vitro, when you have these, these, uh, these are seizure-like events triggered by removing zero magnesium. When, uh, when that happens, if we measure chloride inside the neurons, and we're using a special microscopic technique to do that, you can see the chloride levels inside the neurons really increases dramatically. So the neurons are filling up with chloride during seizures. If we do another experiment where we record the activity of neurons whilst we puff gabaron before during and after a seizure, uh, we should be activating the major inhibitory neuro, uh, neurotransmitter system, the GABA-A receptors. You can see before the seizure, GABA is inhibitory. During the seizure, though, it becomes excitatory, actually triggering action potentials before going back to normal. So the major inhibitory system has been subverted to become excitatory during the seizure. And this is really important because uh, you know, uh, status epilepticus or uh, persistent seizures that don't stop by themselves are a big medical problem in the clinical context with high mortality and morbidity sometimes, uh, especially more common in the developing world context where it can take a long time for a patient who's seizing to get care. Uh, and interestingly, the first line treatment at the moment are uh, benzodiazepine class of drugs GABA, uh, that act on GABA A receptors, and they're often ineffective. So uh, it's just worth thinking, you know, if benzos are activating GABA-A receptors, this is normally good under normal conditions, but if neurons are full of chloride, maybe they, they won't work so well or could make things worse. Uh, and uh, Richard, who will answer some questions next, has done some wonderful work on this uh, in two papers um, that have been published relatively recently where we explore this in issue of how uh, brains can become resistant to benzodiazepines as seizures progress. We found that the longer someone has been seizing, the more likely they are to be benzodiazepine resistant due to chloride loading as one possible explanation. So I've gone over time. Uh, with that, I hope I've uh, spoke to you a little bit about what it's like trying to set up a lab in Africa and give me some tips and spoke about two interesting projects. So I'd like to thank the, my lab who've been wonderful and done all the research and our funders. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Richard. That was really inspiring. I'd like to hand over to uh, Richard and Alina for any comments about that because you guys are truly in the field and have been have deep insight into uh, into this. Richard, yeah, would you, you like to, to go first? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to do the polite thing and then I'll go. Um, okay, I'll, I, I've just got a few comments that I think Joe, uh, Joe obviously put a, a brilliant talk together. Um, just a few things that I've, I've kind of learned along the way, having started my research training in, in Africa and, and, and um, have benefited from training a little bit overseas um, and the perspective that's given. And uh, 
also to speak to some of the questions that have already come up in the question board around access. So I think the first thing to say is that basic science training is very different from clinical um, research training in that it, it often requires completely separate and um, equipment and, and expertise, which can't readily be integrated into the clinical infrastructure. So it, it's almost in a way it needs to be dealt with completely separately, but at the same time does also need to be integrated. Um, and the reason why I mentioned that is that um, to do basic science training, one does need to be in an, in an environment which will be amenable to that um, and to, to learn how to do it properly from the onset. And, and unfortunately, there is a bias to the places that you can do that because some historically certain places are more privileged than others in terms of their resources and the, the institutions that have benefit from that. Um, and some, it, it's not possible to do the type of research, especially the, the type of research that Joe has shown in his talk universally within Africa. Um, that being said, there are amazing training opportunities um, that are available not only to train within Africa, but also to go abroad. And they're particularly catered around people coming from low middle income countries. And um, I, I often get approached by um, junior colleagues who are wanting to kind of extend their research training in, in basic science and also in, in clinical um, around these opportunities. And, and I wouldn't say, I wouldn't go as far as saying there's more funding available for people that are coming from low middle income countries, but there's certainly a, a, a rich supply of it. Um, and what's particularly encouraging is, is how research institutions within the, in, uh, the, the research developed world are, are reaching out to try and, and, and uh, cater for that. Um, so that's that's just one thing. Uh, the other thing I, I, I just wanted to, to point out around with regards to research, because this came out in Pauline's talk as well, when one talks about publications. Um, in, in clinical research, describing a, a, the epidemiology in a local setting or within a content is, is, is valuable to clinical research and journals will be attracted to that because there's a novelty within that um, that will be appealing. When it comes to basic science, unfortunately, it's a little less forgiving. And so to, to publish in high impact journals that are gonna attract funding, which is very competitive as we've heard, um, journals don't discriminate between whether or not it's come from a setting of low income. Um, so it doesn't have the same resources compared to state, a place like the US or in Europe where they've got lots of resources. And, and I don't have an answer to this question, but it is a reality. And then I think that's when one is looking at designing research projects, what Joe Romando has done brilliantly is try to really capitalize on the uniqueness of African problems. Um, and that has, has been worked well for him getting access to those journals and getting interest from them. Um, so that's my two cents to start off. And Alina, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. Um, so you, there's really nothing that you or Joe have said that I won't, you wouldn't agree with. And um, I think just you know, my, looking at, at uh, Joe's slides, uh, one thing that actually struck me and that came to mind was, um, you know, all of those photographs were of his laboratories were taken of the equipment and the work that's actually done in his laboratory. And um, I think yourself, you were you were commenting commenting early about basically being cautious about you know doing research and collaborations with um, agent, you know, with overseas, with, you know, researchers and institution in high income countries and making certain, you know, that you, your authorship is either first or last because that obviously influences funding opportunities, et cetera. But added to that, you know, in, in addition to the agency over the data that's generated through the research, I think it's important to also try to maintain or, you know, hold on to some agency of the actual work done. You know, so in, in what I'm trying to say, what I'm what I mean by this is that sometimes, certainly in basic research, I'm a geneticist, so it's obviously about genetic research. Some things, uh, particularly when you're doing it for the first time, are not perhaps easily done in Africa or in your own setting, and they are, you know, you you sort of your you, your collaborators or your your uh, research partners. You know, certain things are done outside of your laboratory, so in a sense, you lose, um, you know. Uh, not ownership, but the agency of the what happens and how it happens in some instances. And I think it's really important to uh, try as much as possible. You know, if there's a piece of advice that I could give to somebody from my own experience to try and hold on to, you know, try and do things which you can do yourself uh, because it, it gives you uh, some control over the process and the time frames and all of those, all of those things, which, you know, often is something that you one doesn't consider. Um, the other thing that happens, 
um, which is obviously not related to all the, you know, in addition to all the challenges that, that um, Joe mentioned in his first slides, the challenge that I find because, uh, you know, that I experience because I'm a, I'm a translational scientist. I have, uh, you know, I have a diagnostic role. Um, I run a you know, laboratory service and I, one of the challenges for me and I don't know how, you know, this is just a you know, comment to put it out there, is then actually taking the research outputs and translating them. Um, actually, you know, outputs that are clearly, obviously beneficial, um, things which are, you know, obviously could easily be translated into improved patient care. It's, it's a little bit of a challenge to actually translate them into diagnostic practice. One looks for ways to get you know, institutional buy-in and, and sort of some kind of political will from, from the authorities to translate the work that you do. Yeah, but I think that's a really good point. I don't know if we've got, we don't have any um, immediate questions on, so I think if that's, that's the case, I might just add some more comments on to what Alina's just spoken about. Um, I think that's well said. I think that translational research in my opinion, is, is rather, rather idealistic because you're brought into this idea that we're going to take something from the bench and we're going to put it to bedside. And, and the practicalities of that is very limited. Um, and that actually all kind of comes down to doing research that is needed and impactful um, based on relevance. And then Charles Newton said this in his talk is that you've really got to be careful around the questions that you ask and you invest time in. Because if you are selective with the questions and you look for the low hanging fruit, which are going to be easy to answer and have maximum impact, um, you're more likely to reach that goal of translating something um, from research to, to some sort of practical um, uh, outcome. And I think that with, certainly within the African context, there's a lot of to be cynical around you know, research infrastructure and, and research um, opportunities, if you will, compared to the global north, but also there's a massive amount of opportunity here um, around the types of questions and these low-hanging fruits where you can do very very simple questions which really require very simple answers but have maximum impact. Um, and there's novelty there that will be attractive to people that are not looking at those questions. My concern, um, and I, I think this is a word of caution and because I've started noticing this trend, is that people within the global north are oversaturated and so now they're starting to ask the questions that are relevant to Africa but from America and from Europe which I find very troubling because now it's taking ownership of a situation and a problem and a novelty, which is not relevant to their context, but they're just trying to um, generate novel data that's going to, to create funds. So that's a word of caution, a word of um, caution. And it's, it's, it goes from basic science questions um, all the way through. One notable example um, is tuberculous meningitis, which you would not see in Europe and you will not see in America. And many clinicians have never seen that condition but you will find more than 10 basic science labs that are studying tuberculosis meningitis. And they are taking funding away from potential African uh, labs that could be doing it locally. or well, certainly collaborating with them in a constructive way that's going to uplift people doing that kind of research. Um, another point is around the computational space. And I think this is a very exciting space that people um, should be looking into. So, I think the first thing to say is, is people get overwhelmed with this idea of computational neuroscience or computational uh, genetics or bioinformatics because it's, it's, it seems so foreign. Um, it's very analytical. Computer science training is very limited. But arguably in the modern world, being able to learn how to code is easier in some senses than in learning a new language or um, and, and actually even getting a basic education because it's, it's freely accessible. It's all on the internet. As long as you've got an internet connection, you can learn how to code. Um, and there's there lots of organizations that are investing in this, but the, the advantage within research is that then you're not dependent on infrastructure. There are freely available data sets which have got um, data that you can just access. Um, and you can ask questions and you can answer questions based on that data. Um, they all depend on your ability to interact with that. And fortunately, because we have people like Joe Ramondo and many others that invested this, there are training schools and training platforms that are now freely accessible for people to um, either come down to a particular institution and learn some skills or things like the Neuromatch Academy where you can link up online and have access to a global community of training that will help you be able to access that. So, I mean, there's lots to talk around this, but I think the thing that I want to kind of set home is that don't be scared of the computational space. Look at it as being a really useful way of doing impactful research 
And for clinicians, if you're interested, that's a good way of running a, a, a kind of a slightly more basic science research interest alongside your clinical practice because you're not beholden to um, the, the logistical issues around doing experimental research for samples, et cetera. Um, you can do it all at home when um, you've got a free time with wherever that may be, which I know is very, very few. Um, yeah, I think I don't know if you've got any other questions. Otherwise, I think we can probably wrap it there. That's brilliant. Thank you, Richard. I mean, I think that there's such important points uh, and there's nothing more exciting than doing research that actually helps and changes your practice, which we've all experienced. So it's my great pleasure to uh, hand the baton back to Vivian, who's going to introduce Richard Idro for the um, fourth talk. All right. I'm very excited to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Richard Idro. He is a senior pediatrician at Macquarie University. He has a Bachelor of Medicine in Pediatrics and Child Health, a Master's in Pediatrics, and a PhD from the University of Amsterdam. He has served on several capacities and on the ILEA board and is not a new face to us. He's also the former president of the Uganda Medical Association and has done extensive neurological research in cerebral malaria and nodding syndrome. I'm excited to invite him today to give us some insights on managing large epidemiological data. Dr. Richard Idro. Hello, everyone. You are welcome to this session in which we shall share about the story of not, uh, the Nerding Syndrome research in Uganda. I am Dr. Richard Idro um, from Makere University School of Medicine. Here we have a school-aged child with the classical head nods of nodding syndrome with accompanying myoclonic uh, jacks. Nodding syndrome is a unique neurological disorder, mostly found in the eastern parts of Africa, uh, affecting several thousand children, and, but associated with pro progressively with uh, different forms of seizure disorders, um, worsening cognitive and motor disabilities and um, cognitive decline. The disease was first described in the 1960s in southern Tanzania, um, but subsequently um, some reports uh, came from Liberia and then uh, southern Sudan and in the northern parts of Uganda. More recently, there have been a few cases, uh, some cases described in the Democratic Republic of Congo and in the Central African Republic. It is estimated that there may be over 10,000 children affected, mainly in, uh, East, in uh, East Africa. In Uganda, the disease was first seen. Now, uh, looking retrospectively, the initial cases might have uh, developed around 1997, 98, in the then, um, area which has been which was uh, overrun by civil strife in the northern parts of Uganda, but the initial actions of government and a systematic investigation started late in the around 2009, 2010, and 2011, and that is when the government developed a nodding syndrome response, and in that response the the areas were to define the epidemic, develop a program of clinical care research in understanding this, this, this disorder, and then a multi-sectoral community government uh, intervention with rehabilitation for the affected persons and developing preventive strategies. And in terms specifically for research, a, a framework on the research priorities was identified in five generic, generic areas of uh, epi more of an epidemic investigation understanding the causes of the problem, uh, first measuring what the problem is, understanding the causes, developing solutions, delivering and translating these this solutions to the community and evaluating the, the response. And uh, in, in these five research areas were, were put together and teams were, uh, were put together to lead these uh, different areas. And personally, I was I led the clinical investigation of the disease. Although later on, um, I also my team, my group also ventured into the pathogenesis and aspects of genetics, and then a, a longitudinal cohort to try to to define the natural history of this disease. 
right from the outset around 2012, um, when this, this was all being put together, we had about 20 children brought to our institution in Mulago Hospital. And uh, we used this opportunity or the presence of these children to conduct detailed clinical examinations, observations. And we wrote this up in a case, in a case series. And from these observations, retrospectively, um, we defined five different stages for nodding syndrome. That initially, these children who develop symptoms usually between the ages of three and eight, and sometimes extending into early adolescence, start with increasing in attention, business, lethargy, and for several weeks before the classical head nods develop. And most of these head nods initially will occur with um, with the sight of food, with a cold breeze in, uh, in, an, an, in an environment. And uh, progressively over a space of one to three years, these children then develop other forms of scissors, tonic clonic scissors, myoclonic scissors, and then uh, some focal uh, scissors. And um, in stage four, you have now the development of other complications, including severe motor, um, motor disabilities, um, uh, motor deformities, you have kyphosclosis, uh, uh, um, scoliosis, as in some of these images um, down here, um, a pectus deformity of the chest. Many of these children have severe vitamin D deficiency in, addi in addition. Um, uh, lip deformities, you have hypertrophied lips, um, and uh, some of the children had uh, growth problems, um, growth failure, you have extremely short uh, uh, children whom we uh, identified had problems, but, uh, particularly with the insulin-like growth factor. We conducted uh, endocrine uh, studies to try and understand this more. Lots of psychiatric abnormalities here. We have this child tethered to a pole uh, because he will wander continuously. Some of them will get lost. Uh, quite a big proportion, over 25% of them had psychotic problems, emotional challenges, mood disorders and uh, aggressive uh, be, uh, behavior. Um, at, at this time, we identified what the most important treatment needs are, and this included control of the scissors, treatment of severe malnutrition, attending to these psychiatric needs, uh, the behavior difficulties. And now, uh, uh, given that many of these children had myoclonic scissors, one of the first things we did was to, to try and use sodium valproate. And within a space of two weeks, we had a more than 50% reduction in the total and the median number of scissors. And so we designed a treatment program and came up addressing some of these needs and then went down in the communities in uh, first um, establishing three treatment centers, one in each of the most affected districts, and then eventually expanded this one to all the region, setting up 17 treatment centers where these children will receive, will receive help. Um, uh, this, these investigations and a summary of these findings were presented to the first ever international uh, scientific meeting on nodding syndrome, which was held in Uganda. And this meeting came up with a known name, and that was when the name nodding syndrome was coined, and then a diagnostic criteria. And uh, we audited the outcomes of this intervention one year into the treatment. And um, then we were glad to have found out that about a quarter of the children had gained scissor freedom for the previous um, month before the before the visitation. And so we knew we were on, on the right track and um, up to 40% of them were back in school as opposed to only 20% before the start of the of the of the of the intervention. But this intervention also helped other children with other convulsive epilepsies in the in in the community because we applied similar principles to all the other people who had uh, children who had convulsive epilepsy. So they received similar interventions because the health workers were trained right across. Now, having put this in place, we then came to the rehabilitation needs. So in, initially, I, uh, we had a team of eight, and we expanded this one to now a team, a multidisciplinary team of, uh, of about 20 people, including internal, phys internal medicine physicians and neurologists, pediatricians, mm -hmm. psychiatrists, 
uh, nurses, um, rehabilitation specialists, uh, counselors, and um, we conducted a large disability study looking at rehabilitation needs, assessing about 200 children in, in their different homes and identified the most common uh, domains which will require rehabilitation and fed this into the government programs for those delivering the rehabilitation services. The other activity was to try and map the area. So working with um, um, colleagues in epidemiology and biostatistics and um, and, um, and geoph geophysics, we conducted a GPS-based uh, study and where we identified each and every, uh, lo the location of each and every child. What then became very interesting and then started really entering into our etiology studies, which I'm going to talk about shortly, was the location of this, this, uh, this, uh, this, these children. That many of them were along, along the, these streams or fast flowing streams in these uh, fairly large uh, rivers in, uh, in these areas, their distribution. And that was one of the things which then started putting clues to us what may be and what may underline the etiology of this this disease and um, and clearly these areas especially what what were marked out as with red dots were the breeding sites, uh, sites from the and from our entomology colleagues which were non breeding sites for the uh, simulian flies and the simulian flies are known to transmit onchocerciasis and given that there had been a possible uh, suspicion that there may be an association with onchocerca florflas this one really proved a very important um, uh, part of the jigsaw in defining what the etiology will be now, our next as aspect was to try to determine what the causes of nodding syndrome will be. And we asked ourselves several questions. This disease was not known in this environment prior to the 1990s. So it is probably it is a new disease. And in, in that case, is it caused by a toxin in the environment? This is a raw region in the water source or in food which is eaten. Is it a genetic disorder or is it caused by an infection? And a number of studies were conducted here. You can um, see me con uh, in one of the comms of one of the local leaders were conducting in the in the different localities. Uh, some of my colleagues and uh, jun junior colleagues, um, um, this gentleman carrying this uh, height board, this is for assessing nutritional status, is, is now a, a psychiatrist, is a faculty in Kabbala University. Um, then uh, just completing his master's training in psychiatry. This is a gentleman who is an epidemiologist, was then in public health conducting his, uh, his, his studies. Since then, we uh, have con um, uh, um, as demonstrated a clear association between nodding syndrome and uh, infection with Oncosaca volvulus. And uh, these results were presented to government and a massive intervention to control onchocerciasis was undertaken, including laviciding the rivers, aerial spraying, twice annual uh, distribution of, um, of, uh, of ivermectin. And um, since 2014, there has been not a new, a single new case of nodding syndrome. We now deal with only the prevalent cases. And so our hypothesis therefore is that Oncosaca volvulus is associated with this disease, whether alone or together with a cofactor. But then given that this is a skin parasite, one of the questions is, how then will a parasite which is in the skin um, cause a problem in the brain? And um, our hypothesis, our working hypothesis is that um, we propose that nodding syndrome is an onkasaka all wolbachi induced neuroinflammatory epileptic encephalopathy with antibodies directed towards this, um, this filarial worm cross-reacting with neuron surface antigens and then inducing this, this disease. We had preliminary studies, one conducted by the CDC group, and then another one by our group, indicating that actually there were some cross-reacting antibodies. 
and uh, presenting these results together, applied for funding to the Medical uh, Research Council, and I was given uh, an African Research Leadership Award, and the award was to to conduct an investigation into the pathogenesis and treatment of nodding syndrome. Received this award in uh, 2015, oh. and from 2016, we set up to conduct two large epidemiological studies. One is a case control study to determine whether this, this such an immune mechanism exists. And then two is to conduct a phase two trial to see whether six, uh, six week course treatment with doxycycline, which inhibits, which kills the Wolbachii in the filarial worms, will improve the outcomes of children with nodding syndrome. And the basis of this is that the adult worms, there, is, there, are, there are no drugs, there are no chemotherapeutic agents currently which can kill the adult uh, filarial worm. They will die of old age five to 15 years later. What we have available is ivermectin, which kills the microfilarial, the daughter worms. And this parasite, a single parasite will produce thousands, hundreds of thousands of microfilaria. And ivermectin is given every six months, it will kill it. But again, after that, after six months, you have another load which is produced. But if you give, um, if you give doxycycline, um, it will kill the Wolbachii, which are, um, which have a synergistic um, um, relationship with um, the adult worms. And because of this, the adult worms lifespan is reduced to under two years. And we thought that if our, our hypothesis was true, then the patients, if given this treatment, after two years will improve. This was a large epidemiological study. And uh, given that there had been a lot of um, studies in this environment, um, uh, our initial attempts to, to start the study um, uh, um, experienced a lot of delays. There was a lot of community um, or community resentment because some of the initial studies which are conducted by different groups did not have their results fed back, and particularly the post-mortem studies. And so we we went to we took some time. We went to Kenya where they are conducting a large uh, community study on the cost on the cost of Kenya. Or we worked with social workers who, who lead the community engagement program. We went land with them. We went in the field. We took the whole research team, the research leadership. We went in the and along the Indian Ocean coast, interacted with communities involved in research, and benchmarked and got our lessons to come and set up our research program. So when we came back, um, we we went into our research mode, but this time we started by engaging the, the research from a different element um, through the district leadership, introducing all the districts where we're recruiting. We had meetings with the, with the district leadership, we involved them. And then we had meetings with the health workers. So we, the health workers in all the different units, what we intended to do. And then the villages where we're going to recruit uh, with. Each, each of the villages in, in these districts have at least two community health, health workers. So we also invited them and, uh, and, and uh, described all these research projects and what we will be doing to, to them. So first was engaging the leadership. Then we started also engaging the community. We, we had radio programs right up, up here. We had our teams going... Um, Across Uganda, there are over 200 FM radio stations, so you can speak in any language, in any of them, and people can listen. So to the wider community that we are coming to conduct a long-term study to understand this thing, then in each of the com specific communities, the village health workers we had talked to arranged meeting days, and we had specific days when we, village, we visited village by village, and you had large meetings, and we... Um, present the whole research concept to this, these meetings. And here in the middle, we have a large village meeting with our research team talking through. And then of course, in, uh, in Africa where people gather, we have a meal. So at the end of it, we had meals and we ate together with the communities. And, uh, and then we set dates of when we'll come to start the research programs. The trial itself, um, uh, 
because of this kind of detailed involvement, things actually take time. And uh, so um, uh, going through the ethical approvals, um, uh, here we estimated the times it took. And of course, um, so at the institutional level, and the regulatory, the national regulatory and the drug authority levels are taking between two months and up to five months to obtain each of these approvals. Then preparing for the, the technical aspects of the study, the IT setting up databases, buying the medical equipment, setting up the buying and setting up the lab. Um, uh, obtaining the necessary vehicles. This is a tough community. We bought several motorcycles and, and uh, to, to aid our movements. And in addition, we build up a research office. This is a very rural community. We build up a research office, recruited um, a study team, trained them, developed the databases. And um, each of these activities took anywhere between one month and seven months. And at the end of it, we have described this process in, uh, in a paper. Just down below here, um, here conducting this is uh, uh, Dr. Anguzo, who is now, um, who is now an assistant pro uh, professor. And then he was a clinical research fellow. He had just completed his master's program. He led the clinical team in, uh, in, in this. And here is the research team in one of the rural communities where we'll set up and we have everybody working together in conducting this study. What are the other things which helped us? And this is partnerships. We developed partnerships with a lot of institutions. So with the University of Bonn to try to look at parasite genomics, uh, with uh, Antwerp uh, Center for Global Health, we had training institutions to help us with setting up some epidemiological studies the US CDC, which conducted some of the initial pilot studies. Of course, the MRC provided us with funding. Um, the, um, the sponsor was the University of uh, Oxford, the Neuroscience Center. They conducted many of the immunological studies. UCL Neurogenetic Center conducted human genetics. We did not identify any abnormal or non genes. The Cambry Welcome program conducted mass spectrometry. We were looking at protein components, which will cross-react. The NIH Parastology Institute. So really working with so many different partners. And in each of these partners, they were mostly willing individuals. We looked at every, um, competence, engaged them, uh, people who had the time, who had the uh, trust and perseverance to try to work. And this has now built that it, this program has provided a learning environment. So in the past several years, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine has been sending their students to come and learn at the implementation of these studies. Oxford University has been sending graduate students. The Sudan Evangelical Ministries has, has been sending their programs to learn our implementation, and they are replicating some of this in South Sudan. And more recently, UCLA uh, epilepsy surgery has been working with the imaging in, um, because we have done brain MRIs on a lot of these uh, children. Of course, locally, the local institutions, uh, um, Kidgum General Hospital and Kidgum local government, but the local government and Lamo local government have really worked to try to support to support us. Others are University of Gent and at the pharmacology department and University of Amsterdam with whom we have been working and us being supported by the government of Uganda and where we resources rent sort on some institutes the government was able to support us in some areas. And through this, we have learned a lot of things. And current, and what is clear is the association with Onkosaka volvulus, but that is not the whole story. We have had some multiple post-mortem studies um, we have had the epidemic description, but some aspects remain unknown. And slowly and slowly, like a jigsaw, we are trying to fit it together in trying to understand this disease. So much so that, as I described, um, now we do not have um, any new cases. This is uh, the seventh year, any new cases of uh, nodding syndrome. The government has maintained the control of Onkosaka. The prevalence rates have dropped to below, um, of Onkosaka infection have dropped below 2% currently. And uh, annually, mass drug administration con uh, continues. Locally, uh, we have built a lot of confidence. Um, we were able to 
improve infrastructure. We were given a, a warehouse which we improved and we built up into a research office. And uh, these were the initial er, er, parts of the construction. And here now we have a lab in that unit. And down below here is now our clinical unit um, where our clinicians are conducting this, this study. We have developed human resource capacity. We have trained through this project two of the six AEG technicians in this country. We have trained a research manager, uh, four MSc students, actually five MSc students have completed, have conducted their thesis on this, and now uh, four PhD students. And, uh, and of these of this four PhD students, um, two of them uh, are now faculty, uh, Dr. Ngozo in Wisconsin and uh, Dr. Gomisiriza, who is in Kabale University and the other two are just about to complete their, their thesis. So we have developed human resource capacity through this, this project. This project has had a lot of challenges. It's in a very difficult area. The vehicles will get stuck, stuck. You had rivers who were crossing in motorcycles. In, uh, telecommunications were difficult. We, are, we had um, Rodney Angozo, who was our lab, a lab manager now uh, completing his PhD on an handheld trying to get a telephone network. Um, lots of bands were able to then eventually work with a local charity in the church to try to design cooking places. Oh, lots of health system challenges, drug stock, uh, stockouts, and uh, really the quality of life. And uh, these are some of the challenges. Of, of course, also negotiating community sentiments and there was a, a lot of suspicion um, um, about uh, the community initially with the central government. People thought some of these things were related to, 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 to the war. And then eventually, many of these children were cognitively impaired. So rape and development and pregnancy and cases of pre uh, pregnancy. We are right now conducting a baby study looking at um, the uh, neurodevelopment of the babies born by children of this um, by mothers who have been affected by nodding syndrome. But one of the things which has helped us across in managing this has been feedback and uh, uh, social support. So at intervals, we have been able to go back to the communities, the disappearance of uh, all caretakers of some of the participants, and we feedback this uh, Pamela, our research manager, um, uh, who has was been leading some of this. Of course, we'll cover really large, long distances to reach to some of this place. So in conclusion, um, I've described some of us, part of our story of the investigation of Nordic syndrome, a devastating disorder, uh, which we now think is associated with Onkosaka volvulus and whose pathogenesis we are still um, uh, studying. We have made a lot of progress in the care of these children. Uh, many are scissor free. There's, uh, although a number remain with severe disabilities, they, it, it, uh, many of them have sustained severe brain injuries. Our research has followed a detailed um, engagement plan with the communities, with central and local governments, with professional groups, with uh, community leadership. And we have worked with multiple partners across the, the world, people who can support our needs. We have identified those who will do different things. We have lived on um, feedback and building and continuing community feedback. Now we have some charities which come and we identify some of the homes which need a lot of help. And these charities are able to support these children. And we have built capacity along the way. Um, I, we had a very young research team and they, many of them have grown. And this has been supported with this detailed research. Our pathogenesis studies is taking shape, but in due course, we'll have a clear understanding of this disease. I want to acknowledge this research team, which has done a fantastic job, um, and all our funders. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Idro, for an amazing conversation. I think the key things that we have taken away from this talk have been the very important need to network. Um, I think a lot of the work cannot be done in one small capacity. 
um, the importance of planning ahead and anticipating delays. I noted that um, some of the IRB you know, approvals took up to seven months, which is extremely long and would delay otherwise um, the process of the, of the research. Um, I think another key thing that we would, uh, I, I liked was the, the, the fact that there was some effort to ensure continuity of this research in terms of making sure that, you know, after the research is done, we don't drop the communities where we've done the research. Um, and so I think these are very key and important things that um, you have shared in this uh, conversation today. Um, and we have opened up the question area. Um, let me just open that up and see what we have coming in. I believe that there's a question from Adam Jana. I am the president of the Foundation of Epilepsy and Stigma Support in Gambia, and I'm hearing about nodding syndrome for the first time. Where can I find more information in the con on the condition? Um, Dr. Idro, are you there? Yes. Um, there's a lot of um, information. Um, at the moment, part of this is, is not that recent. Um, around the time when there were many cases in uh, South Sudan and in Uganda, there were lots of media um, media information. But this, this are still available on the on the website and um, also the IILE websites. We we have this information in uh, West Africa. Um, the only cases which were reported were in um, in the late 80s and early 90s. It was most in Liberia, and uh, since then, with the implementation of bronchotachiasis control, there there has been no further. If one goes on the web, you will find this information. Right, and maybe Dr. Idra, just to add on to a question um, on that, um, for somebody hoping to do large epidemiological studies, do you have some um, resources that you could share with them on where to get funding and things like that? Um, so, before one gets into a large study, um, one has to do the small ones. Um, you need to learn to crawl before you, you get into to walk and before you run. And that, so the principles are, are always the same, that one is able to conduct in that specific group what what clinical study can you do? What basic science study can you do? A small, a small descriptive thing, something you can go away with, something which you can then present. Because even the funding agencies, uh, nobody will give for you money for a, a large thing unless you demonstrate that you have done a small one. There is there is a potential for success. There is a finding which is uh, which which shows. Uh, promise something which can be seen that uh, you are able to from the side of the study but also on you as as an investigator that, that there is the potential for uh, that you can manage this. um so those two elements need to be demonstrated and uh, if that is done um the there is funding outside there. And for the smaller ones, there are many charities. For example, ours, the earlier ones, it was uh, charities like the Waterloo Foundation. Uh, several of them gave us uh, money which we used for the initial studies. Okay, thank you very much. Right. Um, there is a question here saying, has nodding syndrome been described in countries outside Africa? where oncosakiasis is endemic? No, um, it has not. Although in, uh, in 1930s, there were some case reports of um, diseases described, especially in Mexico, which sounded similar to what we think is nodding syndrome. Uh, in the 1930s around central uh, in the central americas uh, in the mexico 
there are some something which sounded similar. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Idro. Unless you have a closing comment, I would like to hand over to John for the next speaker. And uh, no, no more. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Richard, and thanks for handing it over. That was such an amazing talk, and uh, sure, what a long way things have gone. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce the final speaker, uh, who we've dragged over from the States. It's a huge privilege to have him with us. So this is um, Prof. Mike Sperling, who's the... Um, Professor Baldwin Keyes Professor of Neurology from the Thomas Jefferson University Hospital in Philadelphia. He's Vice Chair of Research for Neurology. He's a Division Chief for Epilepsy. He's Director of the Jefferson Comprehensive Epilepsy Care and Director of Clinical Neurophysiology Lab. And most important for us and to help us, he's been Editor-in-Chief of Epilepsia since 2014. And I think we're really looking forward to hearing uh, his gems that he's going to give us uh, this evening as the final talk. Hello, my name is Michael Sperling. I'm the Baldwin Keys Professor of Neurology and Vice Chair for Clinical Research at Thomas Jefferson University. Today, I'm going to speak to you about key things to consider when writing a research paper. I'll pull up my presentation and we can get started. Uh, it's a pleasure to speak to you and I want to thank Professor Wilmshurst for the kind invitation. In addition to uh, being an epilepsy researcher at Thomas Jefferson University, and uh, Vice Chair for Clinical Research. I'm also the co-editor-in-chief of Epilepsy, so I can speak about publications for some, from some experience from having written papers and also uh, from the perspective of an editor. So let us begin now. And what do we consider? And really the first thing is about the research itself. So let's discuss that briefly. Why do we conduct medical research? Uh, because if you're gonna write about it, you, want to, you have to do it and you have to do it well. And it's important to think about the rationale and the reasons for doing this. So why do we conduct medical research or other kinds of research? We want to advance knowledge for the good of society. We want to improve the health of individuals and society. We want to find better methods of preventing disease. We want to find better methods of diagnosing and treating disease. We want to understand disease better if we're in the medical research field. So all of this is why we're doing it, and we want to design our projects that fundamentally fills these overall aims. This is the overarching rationale for doing it. For us personally, by participating in research, it encourages critical thinking on our own part and our means of critically appraising information as we read it and learn it. It improves our understanding of clinical medicine. It helps us develop teamwork skills, and also in doing it, it exposes people to the best clinical minds. So even if I didn't do research, I read research all the time. Every time we read medical articles, we read about new studies, we're reading research. We have to be able to evaluate that. We have to think about it critically and critically appraise it. We have to decide whether we should believe this. We've seen so many articles published on a topic where five people find one thing and then seven people contradict them and it goes back and forth. If we can critically appraise the articles, we know who to believe and who not to believe. We can realize the limitations and perhaps figure out how to function through this mishmash of conflict. And the best way to learn to think critically and critically appraise it is by doing it yourself. You know, if I were to become a judge at a diving contest or a swimming contest, if I didn't know how to dive, it would be difficult for me to be a good judge. By doing it myself, I can much better appreciate what that diver is doing when, when diving off of a high platform into a pool. The same thing applies to research. Now, why do we publish? We publish to report what we've learned. We've conducted research. Presumably, we've learned something useful that will foster knowledge in others, and we want to report these advances in knowledge. We want to educate other people. And also, by reporting it, we educate ourselves, because when we have to write it up into a paper, we're forced to critically think about what we've done and, and synthesize it and get it down in a nice package. And there's a clear intellectual satisfaction to doing this. Now, in deciding what to do, we want to find topics. 
So we've got a nice surprise for you. We're going to get the slides up because they decided to do an African disappearing act. Luckily, Mike is organized and has them ready uh, to like zoom in and uh, share them because I'm sure that uh, at this time, it's quite late for us here, Mike. So I'm impressed with everybody staying awake. Um, so you should have shared. Yeah, great. You've got sharing capacity. Here we go. Can you see my slides? Yes, beautiful. Thank okay, you. Good. Go ahead. My apologies. I, I recorded this at night at home and I, I shared a, a screen. I thought that I must have shared a window rather than a screen. So I will move ahead, but there are slides that you can follow and I'll be able to move a little faster than I would have otherwise since it's late there. Uh, so in any case, I said, why publish? And as I started saying in, that, in the recording, to report advances in knowledge and foster education of others and yourself and intellectual satisfaction. And to me, these are really the three prime areas. In order to be successful at it and, and, and enjoy it, which is most important, uh, I think you have to find topics that excite you and interest you for research and publication, and then try to do it as well as possible. Don't, don't do a, a job that's halfway, and none of us try to do that. We really want to strive for excellence and strive to get better. It, it's my greatest neurosis that I'm a perfectionist, but it's also the biggest advantage I have. Uh, sometimes it leaves a little unhappiness. I always wish I had done it better, like the recording I made for no purpose at this point, uh, but to do it better each time. And I think that's how you get better at writing. The bad reason to write is because you need it to be promoted. You won't enjoy it. You won't do a very good job necessarily. And, and you certainly won't find it uh, a fulfilling activity. We can do any number of things. We can do original science reports. We can write reviews and by writing academic reviews, these can be educational. And, and a purely educational focus is all acceptable, but to write a, a successful paper that will be published by a journal, it, you can be in any of those areas. And I would emphasize again that quantity is far more important than quality. Uh, it's much better to write a few really good papers than a lot of papers that are really of questionable quality or, or not of great interest. They may be very high quality, but not terribly relevant. Now in choosing a research project to publish, and in designing a research project, it, it's really the same thing. So you want to design something that's going to be publishable. There's no point planning a project that won't be publishable uh, because there would be no reason to do it. And ideally, what you want to do is answer these four questions. Is the research question relevant for scientists, clinicians, or patients? So is this, is this a relevant topic? And this is where I said something could be good, but so obscure that no one cares. If you report the first patient in the world with something, I suppose it's interesting. To report number three after the first one was reported 30 years ago is probably not terribly useful. Uh, you want something that's relevant for scientists, clinicians, or patients. You want to make certain that the design and the methods are appropriate. Think about it carefully. Ultimately, when you're writing it, and when I'm reading your paper, or any other paper that I read in the journal, is the full report accessible? Can I make sense of it? Is there, is there enough information provided so that I can judge the work? and make sense of it. For peer review, this is necessary. Uh, what are the methods that are used? What were the general results? And what's becoming popular now and really starting to become mand mandatory when we publish papers through uh, that are funded by NIH, for example, or, or the European uh, Union agencies, we're required to put the data in a file that's open to anyone. So anybody can go to my file, my research paper that I published, get my data, de-identified, so no patients are, are, uh, are compromised in any way, and analyze it and see that I do my statistic properly. Is my answer correct? And last, we wanna make sure it's unbiased and clinically meaningful. And this is perhaps most important when we're talking about commercial entities publishing research. They often sh will not do projects that might cast their product in a harmful light, and they're going to try to design projects for a specific purpose. If the purpose is to have a drug approved for, approved for regulatory purposes, the trial won't be biased, but it's going to be designed to show an effect if possible. And is it clinically meaningful? Well, the regulatory agency will want this too, so they will have to come up with a clinically meaningful endpoint that they have. But these all, all matter. From the journal's point of view, we're interested in all of that. And again, we want to be interesting. So we want information that is of interest to the reader. So when, when I'm writing a research paper based on a project that I designed, I want that to be new information of interest to the readers. I could have 
a fabulous new way of proving that the sun rises in the east, but nobody would be interested in that. We know the sun rises in the east. It's been known for thousands of years, probably tens of thousands of years. We want new information of interest. So we want to advance knowledge, be it fundamental or practical, and have some impact on the field, either, again, theoretically or practically. So ideally, we are building an edifice of scientific knowledge, and each paper, each research project is a brick in that edifice. Every once in a while, we do a project and we realize the edifice is wrong. When Einstein came up with the theory of relativity, it didn't prove that Newton was wrong, but it proved that Newton was approximate. And the same thing exists. Lots of fields are different. Genetics is utterly different than it was 20 years ago. Uh, immunology is quite different than it was pre-AIDS and HIV. Uh, it, it forced vast new amounts of knowledge. And sometimes the entire structure must be knocked down and a new one built from scratch. And often the, some of the old bricks in the structure will fit in the new one and graft very nicely and make it even stronger. So that's what we want to do. You want to make sure your topics are pertinent to the journal. For example, epilepsy is not the journal to report your experience with ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, unless there's a focus on people with seizures. And then if the focus is on ADHD, it's still probably not right. We get papers all the time on other topics. Uh, and it's, it's hard to say the title of the journal is epilepsy. You think people would realize it's about epilepsy. You know, the fifth report of a finding is not new. So again, it, a fifth report might have new information and it makes sure that your project is designed to develop something new that fosters additional understanding. And again, you may have the largest case series in the world. You may have a thousand patients who you did a particular procedure on who have a particular disease, but if it imparts no new knowledge, there's not an advantage. So again, that is not a research project worth embarking upon. Dozens or hundreds of hours of work collecting data, analyzing data, and if your conclusions are already what is known, all you have is the world's largest case series. You'll get it published somewhere, but it really hasn't added to the world's knowledge. And again, obscure or rare observations may or may not be important. You know, it's like case reports or small case series. And you have to ask yourself a question, will publicizing the observation be helpful to others? Will it foster understanding of disease? If the answer is yes, it's certainly worth publishing. If it's an odd thing that you saw and you learned something, but other people know, or it, it, it's really not of interest, it's not worth doing. And again, early cases of a new disease is also helpful. So when COVID-19 first came out two years ago, many papers, thousands of papers have been published on this. No one knew anything about it. Case reports, small series, basic knowledge, all had to be gathered, it's worth accepting. The same thing happened in the 1980s when AIDS and HIV were first discovered. This is how knowledge has advanced significantly. And then journals will have different criteria with new diseases. As the previous speaker who gave a very nice talk, my compliments on the nodding syndrome. Again, this is a relatively new disease uh, in, in the grand scheme of things. And to many people outside of Africa, it's an unknown disease that's not been seen. So this is something that's worth additional knowledge as well. So you have to think about the context. You need a primary research question and a testable hypothesis. You need a reason to ask the question so that, you know, what is the question you're asking and why is it important? And, and when you're writing a paper, the introductory portion of the paper, the introduction should basically be this. I have a question that I'm posing and why am I posing this question? And then what is my hypothesis? And my hypothesis is a testable question with a yes or no answer. You know, treatment X is better than treatment Y or this factor is different than that factor, and, and you can apply a statistic to it uh, by and large. Certain observational studies, especially epidemiologic studies, may not have an overall hypothesis. You're assessing the incidence and prevalence of a disease or an illness in a certain area, and that's perfectly fine. Uh, if, if not much is known about it, then it's going to be of general interest. If a lot is known and you're studying ep, you know, the incidence or prevalence of epilepsy, for example, in a particular province, Again, that's perfectly useful and it may be very helpful for regulatory authorities, uh, for the government planning on what resources need to go into that area, but it may not be suitable for a general scientific journal. It may be better for some local journal or other kind of publication where, again, it informs the people who need, the, who need that information. Uh, you know, the person in Germany may not particularly care what the incidence of uh, epilepsy is in a particular district within the city of Philadelphia where I work. It's helpful to the Philadelphia Health Authority, however, they would want it maybe in their bulletin, it would be useful, useful to publish. And again, we wanna make sure there's a hypothesis. So avoiding fishing expeditions, let me gather a lot of data, run it through statistics and see if something comes up. If there's no testable hypothesis to explain the finding, 
it doesn't matter. It was not a useful project. And I, as editor of Epilepsy, I get papers like this all the time. We get lots of papers, particularly on MRI now, where people have MRI analyses of functional MRI or structural MRI, and they just compare everything and see if something's different than the general population or from one disease to another. But it, if it affords no additional understanding, it's not terribly helpful. Now, journals publish information of interest. How do we assess this? And one way is, is the work cited. So you may, may have heard of the impact factor of journals. And the impact factor basically looks at how often articles in recent years, in the recent two years, or there could be a three-year impact factor, three years, have been cited. And better journals have higher impact factors. Uh, and, and that, in part, reflects the relevance for fostering research in other publications. If a work is cited, somebody else is writing on this topic, someone else is doing research or writing reviews on this topic. However, again, the amount of citation is going to depend upon the number of people writing in that area. If it's a small people writing in a particular area, it's not going to be cited very much. It doesn't mean it's important. It just means there are fewer people working on it. And also, most citations tend to come from society guidelines, from definitions, et cetera, and from review articles, which do not reflect the quality of the original research. So you know, some very highly cited journals, like the New England Journal of Medicine or Lancet or in, in neurology brain, for example, that have high rates, uh, often much of this is based on uh, guidelines and review articles rather than the original research. And then certain types of things. So the New England Journal is very heavily interested in publishing pharmacology trials and drug treatment trials. These tend to be highly cited. It's going to get their impact factor up. It doesn't mean the study is any better. It just means that you know, drug companies are having lots of review articles written. Other people are working in the field and more articles are written on that. Does the work attract publicity? There's something called altimetrics with your peer reviews and the faculty of a thousand citations on Wikipedia. Mainstream media coverage, does it appear in the newspaper locally, nationally, internationally, and reference managers? That is an indication of interest as well. So this is one method of knowing how we do it. For manuscript structure that you're writing, it's critical to the success of submission. So there's an introduction where I said, you have the basic question being asked and what's the overall objective of your work? What's the hypothesis and why does this matter? How does this help us? Modest amount of background is not there, enough to frame the question. Now, I want to know if people with tonic-clonic seizures hurt themselves very often, why is this important? Because we can develop new protection devices that will protect people from falls, but we only know if it's worth spending millions of dollars to develop a protection device, for example, a personal airbag, should enough people fall to make it worth the investment. And that's the, that's the matter. And that's a business question, but it's a research question also. And that's enough. In the methods, you want to be precise, define your terms, describe clearly and concisely so others can replicate your work. And that's very important. If I don't know what you did, I can't replicate it. If I can't replicate it, I probably shouldn't believe it. And lastly, underline, consult a statistician. So you see the two underlines. Why does this matter? Very important. Consult a statistician. Make sure it's done properly. And whenever possible, have a control group. Some things are not suitable for control groups or you have internal controls, but you want to have a control group. With the results when you're writing a paper, present the most important results early. Ensure there's a logical flow so I can make sense of it. And then in the discussion, interpret the data, critique your data. Don't recapitulate it. You have all the findings and the results. In the discussion is meant to discuss what you, what you found and why this matters. Pardon me, I just got a message from my computer that it's about to restart. Let me have it snooze. Uh, okay. Uh, don't recapitulate it. What are the limitations? And discuss the important things first. What's the important matter? Discuss that first, just like you present the important results early, the main findings. What is it there? And then before you submit your paper to a journal, have colleagues and friends read it, critically review it, and revise it before submission. You don't want to send it to a journal and have a lot of criticisms. First come then, get the criticisms before you send it in. Uh, when I was first starting out, I had a colleague that I worked with and who I enjoyed working with, but I would give him papers and he would make minor editing changes in my wording. It's not what I looked for. I wanted somebody who would savagely critique my paper, point out any flaws, raise questions, force me to do major rewrites. And then I knew when I sent it into a journal, I was in good shape because the journal wouldn't do that. And lastly, if English is not your native language or if it, if it, you know, or, or if, it, if it's not your native language and you've not spent a lot of time in you know, highly fluent in English, have a fluent English speaker edit the paper before submission. Uh, I, I doubt it's a problem for people attending this meeting, but I can tell you from some other countries where English is not so widely spoken, 
we get papers and it's sometimes hard to understand what the authors are saying. So you want your paper to be clear. It's not a matter of grammar and syntax. That's easy to fix. It's making sure that it's written clearly so we know what you mean. One can write a review article, which is a timely review that educates and provokes thought. It might foster new research or improve practice. So if you're writing a review, prevent a full perspective, summarize the information and be critical. Uh, don't be superficial. I had a review come back from a reviewer once for a, a review written by a friend of mine. And what he wrote in the review article is this paper is a mile wide and an inch deep. The, the author wrote a lot about a lot of different aspects, but covered everything superficially. You want to be well focused and critically appraise the research, simply saying these people found X percent, these people found Y percent. It's not good enough. Synthesize it and, be, and critically appraise it. And don't duplicate other published reviews. Figure out what the review adds to the literature find something new. And then guidelines and best practices are important. If you're doing something like that, what's the guideline that for practice or best practices, make sure appropriate methodology is being used. So the, what the journals are looking for are papers that are understandable to the audience of the journal, so all of the aforementioned. And if it's highly technical in aspects, the details should explain so it's comprehensible to intelligent generalists. If I get a paper that's filled with a lot of mathematical equations, I know that I don't, I'm not going to understand it, nor are most of our readers. It can have a little math in it, but it better be explained in English. And as I said just before, the English should be fluent and natural with a good writing style and proper syntax. Scientific advances are usually incremental, so you don't have to set the world on fire. Newton and Einstein and some others are celebrated because they were extraordinary. You know, a small advance is good enough. We want to generate some light. Uh, I'm going to skip that. Uh, there, you know, what's happening in publishing in general the financial systems are, are changing. And I mentioned this for your knowledge. You'll see a, a lot about open access. Uh, in Europe, it's becoming more common that government funding agencies are insisting that pay, authors publish papers in journals that are open access. Uh, right now, you can publish a journal in many, uh, an article in many journals for free, but if you want open access online, then you have to pay money. The fees vary tremendously. So for example, if you're in the United States or Europe or Australia, uh, wealthy countries, uh, the cost of making a paper open access is 3,500 US dollars. It's quite expensive. Uh, it's ex too expensive for me, frankly, uh, for ordinary papers, I, I wouldn't do it. Uh, if you're from a country which is a lower income or lower middle income country, then the costs are, are really much lower. It can be as little as $10 or $50 to the same journal. Uh, and you can often ask an editor for free open access if you want. So that's just a tip to you. If you think the paper is important, a lot of people need it. Uh, and a, a, mo a very modest fee is even challenging because your hospital system won't pay for it. Often you can get something for free for open access. Uh, paper, papers are important. Journals survive by doing them. They, they, they make money by selling journal subscriptions or by selling open access. And this is a, a natural conflict. And not only that, but a lot of journals are major journals of society. So the journal uh, Epilepsy, for example, is the journal of the International League Against Epilepsy. Uh, the league derives a significant part of its annual income from royalties from the journal. The publisher also derives some income from royalties from the journal. So you know, you, there's the potential to harm the professional society if everything is free, but suddenly the society doesn't have money and it can't afford to throw symposia on anymore. Uh, and this is true for many journals. I mean, the New England Journal is the Journal of the Massachusetts Medical Society, uh, uh, and, and, and a variety of societies have this. So it, it's where we're going. We're moving away from traditional papers to an extent, yes and no. So no, traditional papers are here to stay, I think, for the foreseeable future. But uh, formats are expanding, so we are moving away. It's nice to be online, and I think you know what we have to do is move more towards interactive features, multimedia, videos, et cetera. And the nature of the presentation can determine the type of presentation. So if I have a journal where my video can't be shown because it has to be online and I need it has to be open access, then you need a journal that does that, which mine doesn't do right now, but it needs to. And the platform has to be friendly so you can look at it on your cell phone or you can look at it on a computer or a tablet. And again, we can reach audiences in different ways. So some final thoughts just to put comments, and this is my last slide. Ensure that your research project is well designed, that it asks a meaningful question and it answers that question. Aim for clarity in writing. Obtain feedback from colleagues and mentors prior to submitting to a journal. It's better to obtain a constructive criticism in advance of submission. 
And if your paper is rejected, take the criticisms to heart, fix the problem or resubmit elsewhere. Too many times I've been tempted and I've seen others say, this reviewer is wrong, that reviewer is wrong, they don't understand me, this is wrong. And then they send it, I had a colleague I worked with, he would get angry, he'd send it to the next journal, the next journal would reject it the exact same way. There's a problem, you need to fix it. Maybe you didn't explain it well enough and you did it correctly, or maybe you need to fix the way you did the project. And then most importantly at the end, like all of the skills, research and writing improves with practice. You have to do it repeatedly to get good at it. Just like playing football or tennis or any, or a piano or a violin, you know, the first time you sit down at a keyboard to play a piano, it doesn't sound very good. You have to practice many days, do it many times until you get good at it. And then the better you are at it, the easier it is to do it well the next time. It's the same with doing research. The way to get good at doing research and publish good research is to practice it. And the first few projects may not be great, but you get the idea, you figure out how to do things and hopefully you get better with time. And here's where it's quite helpful to work with an experienced mentor or advisor when starting out or even not when starting out, just to have a smart person who's experienced, take a look at it uh, and, and see what that person thinks because this will improve the quality of your research and the quality of your publication. And I will end here, thank you. I will stop sharing my screen. Mike, thank you. That was such a brilliant overview. Um, we, we have a chat function here, which is um, stunned into silence, apart from the one person that was awake and realized that your slides weren't showing as well. Um, are there any burning questions from the group? Richard. Um, thanks, Professor Fetter. That's a really wonderful insight into the other side of publishing, because I think many of us only really have the point of view from submitting papers, not actually editing them and actually having that full breadth of the of the field. Um, so I, I've, I've got a question to you around this issue around quantity and quality, um, because I'm a you know, junior researcher, if you will, and, and it's something I'm kind of constantly faced with now is whether or not you invest in projects um, which are of high quality, which comes with a significant risk because you spend lots of time and developing them over uh, many, many years. Um, and all then just publishing frequently and this, this whole um, age old saying of publish or perish. Um, I know in your talk, you kind of, you mentioned around, you know, investing in quality versus quantity. But when, you, when you're throttled by career advancement, which is, demanding that you publish and is, is rating you on, on the number of publications that you have compared to others. How do you, how do you reconcile that? How do you, what would you recommend to people who are starting off in research? Because as you've also said, you need to practice in order to get better, but in order to practice, you need to produce lots of quantity and compromise on quality. So it's, it's, it's one of these things that I, I've, I've sort of spent a lot of time thinking about and how you, how you sort it out, um, or how, you, how you get around it. Um, this, is, this is the inherent contradiction, and uh, I apologize, I'm looking at my shirt, I realized I wore a striped shirt today, which is making me <laughs> look like a, some sort of a Rorschach test at times, perhaps, uh, 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 but so if, if it looks distracting, I apologize, but this quantity versus quality, so the answer is you try to do both, and it depends upon your time and your resources, so I always, what I did when I was younger starting out, when I advised my young people, if have, have the major impact project, but always have one or two smaller things running along the side that won't take very much time that you can finish quickly and write up. So, you know, my, you know, my first big project, my first NIH grant, it's a five-year project. I was going to have two papers at the end of five years from this, which is not, and I was at the University of Pennsylvania where when I went from assistant to associate professor, I had, I think, 35 papers in order to be, to be promoted. And they had, and I was first author in two thirds of them or three quarters of them. Uh, so you have to do that. So you can have smaller papers and smaller projects that are not, perhaps not quite as time intensive and take so long, uh, but you can still design relatively good quality work, I think, that moves along. And again, if, if it advances the field somewhat, you'll get, you'll get ahead. And there's no doubt in my university, they're looking for at least a paper or two a year but what you can do is again, break it up into pieces. And to a certain extent, you're, you're advancing incrementally. So you have the big project you, and you have to think strategically about it when you're designing projects and working strategically. How do I develop this? What are the side projects? What you want at the end of the time that comes for promotion is people to look at your CV and say that you have a body of work, of work that coheres and makes sense 
and is a structure. It's not one thing in this area, another thing in the second area, something in the third area, an hour thing here off to the side, and you look and you can't figure out what that person does. And even you know, in, in the, I think in, in this, this era to say epilepsy is especially is not good enough. For me, it was epilepsy surgery with electrophysiology, you know, fairly narrowly focused. I could, I could find things in that area. And there's no doubt as, the, as more knowledge is gained, it becomes harder to learn new things. Uh, and this is then where you have to be creative and also think about technology. And in a resource limited environment, it's tougher than in a non-resource limited environment, but, it, but there are very few places that aren't somewhat resource limited. So me at my university in the US, I, I don't have a 7T magnet. You know, it's taken me four years of arguing and fighting when we finally got elastography on our new MRI machine set up, uh, which is a fairly sophisticated technique. You'll be able to find things which may be somewhat technologically based or maybe not quite as much technologically based, uh, or maybe you develop collaborations. So I, I did some research on genetics. I didn't have somebody at Jefferson. I found somebody at another university and created a collaboration. My job was getting blood and brain. And then I just had to stick it in a, in a box with dry ice and mail it. And then the analysis could be done elsewhere. And, 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 I would mail things across the country. I could mail things to Europe. You know, you just need Federal Express to pick up the box, get it on the plane, and, and, and have it delivered in a day, which, which is a lot cheaper than hiring a geneticist and having a lab that does a lot of genetic testing if you don't have it available. But I think you have to think about expanding collaborations, coming up with ideas. And you know, Professor Wilmshurst, I think, is a master of that. You can look at her CV if you run her name through PubMed or Scopus. Lots of papers are multinational papers uh, through other people at other institutions outside, outside of the country, outside the continent. Uh, so I think you do have to be strategic. You can have a big project and the smaller ones. Make sure the small ones follow a sensible line. A well-designed research project raises two more questions. You answer one and you raise two at least that you have to follow. Uh, the very first grant I wrote, uh, my mentor, Pete Engel, told me he didn't think it should be funded because it answered the question perfectly, but it didn't raise any new questions. He thought I shouldn't have been funded, <laughs> which was a little harsh, I thought. <laughs> uh, but he was right in that sense, that, that specific topic. But what he hadn't seen, I was studying prolactin in seizures and brain stimulation, that prolactin was an, uh, is an endocrine uh, hormone, and I could expand my hormones out and then have 15 other questions that I could take by not simply focusing on one hormone so I could expand it. So, so I, I hope that answers your question partly, but you really do have to think strategically. And again, I would always have two things running because your big project might fail. You might do that and your hypothesis is incorrect. And, and that yeah. is, you have the other things. If it's a good question, a negative answer is still helpful and useful, uh, but the New England Journal is never going to publish a negative study. Well, well, well that's, that's the inherent um, problem that we've got, right? It's like you can get a negative answer, which is very useful, but it's not attractive. Yeah, and that's that's something that's quite stifling. Yeah, Richard, it's a problem. Thank you. So, so Mike, thank you. So I, I just got one comment that's come through on the chat group from uh, Mayeso, uh, who says, in my setting Malawi, many people look at research and publishing as a secondary source of income, i.e. promotion and grant money. I suppose doing research for the love of research here depends on how much support you get from your institution, funding, adequate salary, etc. With the high burden of teaching, administrative, and clinical duties, doing research for the love of it is quite rare here. So, Mike, we're not expecting you to answer or solve that, but I think it's quite a salient endpoint to um, kind of rationalise some of the challenges that we have. Um, Mike, I want to thank you. I'm going to hand over to Vivian now because we are more or less out of time, uh, just to close the session. Um, and to thank the panelists and the speakers. Vivian, over to you. Um, thank you I want to thank everybody for coming today. It's such an amazing um, talk today. Um, just to say thank you very much, a special thank you to the people who took the time to give the presentations. We appreciate you and we have learned a vast amount of things from each of you. And I believe each of these talks have been salient and very um, required at the time that we have had this talk. Um, just to remind everybody, this is only part two of a fourth Siri um, Epi Skills, uh, you know, conference, um, which is meant to be a replacement for our annual Africa 
in you know conference. Um, see you again in September, and uh, I just want to give a, an applause to everybody that has taken the time to be with us today. Thank you.